It's time to start to talk about our next series of the day. SK Gaming going against Immortals. Now, honestly, this is kind of my my game to watch for today. When you look <laughs> when you look at the teams here, like SK Gaming, I've already mentioned it. They are the European hope. This is a team that they've not actually had the perfect season. Let's not pretend like it was smooth sailing to get to the first seed position. But I feel like to some extent. This is what they were wanting in London. Let's remember, all the way back in London, they were robbed of their buy in day one. They came in third <laughs> seed, and it, it wasn't a pretty sight at the end of it. But now they got that buy, they got that first seed, and they are coming in as strong as ever. Yeah, they had a little bit of trouble early in the season, some roster issues. They ended up replacing their captain, which is usually something that takes a long time to, for a team to adjust to, but it was instantaneous. With Raph stepping, in, stepping into this roster, they looked infinitely better, and you see the result with them being the number one seed overall from Europe have been so consistent. You know, all three of these players, Kavalafar, Tyrus, and Raph, all three of them are capable of yeah. being an outstanding playmaker, but all three of them are also exceptionally consistent. Yeah, and Sweejay, talk to me about the in-game stuff for this team. What is it that makes SK Gaming as, as formidable as they are? When I think of SK, they're like the TSM of Europe because they have such innovative drafts. They are the ones that introduced CP Idris in the Vainglory 8 this season, and Kovalafar was able to play from melee heroes to weapon bar hero. He can play almost anything in the lane that he wants to, even a lane Lance, for example. So this team has very innovative drafts. They might catch Immortals off guard, and I think this is the advantage that they have. The hope of EU is really in that innovation that Trump card they can pull out here against an NA team. And they need to pull everything out against Immortals because they cannot underestimate Immortals. And speaking of that innovation and Kavalafar's ability to play so many different heroes, you know, he's been quoted in the past as saying, I feel I can comfortably take any hero in the game into the lane and do well with it. And that's one of the things that makes them so difficult to yeah. prepare against is because you don't know at any given point what Kavalafar is going to play. Yeah. But he can make just about anything look good in the lane. And I mean, when we talk about that, we've seen a few weapon graces across the course of this championship. He was the one that initially made that weapon grace work in the lane. He was the one that actually found a win with that pick. And it's something that it's been kind of a controversial pick across the course of this season in general. But this is definitely a team that cannot be sniffed at and if you're an EU fan at home right now this is the team that you've got to be putting your hopes in if you want EU to take a series here if you want EU to move on to tomorrow you've only got SK and G2 remaining and SK as the first seed they've got to be that European hope and now let's talk about their opponents as well Immortals this was the team probably the most hyped team in North America coming out of the challenge battles they were heralded as this TSM Slayer We've been saying it all of yesterday. <laughs> Today is the opportunity to prove themselves. If they can make it into the semifinals, if they can make it further into the tournament, that is their opportunity to really make a mark on the scene. I mean, we saw D'Enzio play against Starting, who's an amazing player and basically outplayed Starting completely. I mean, and look at Max Green. That both of them played out of their minds. And if, you, if T Tires then also steps up and gets this insane Super Saiyan mode too, this life buff that he's known to have, then this team is unstoppable. Like mechanically, every single row, I think they are better than SK. SK has the advantage when it comes to macro and potentially draft. But then again, even in the draft, Immortals has Hot Sauce, who's known for very innovative compositions. So this is really a catch-22. We don't know how this will play until we see the first game. Yeah, and it's gotta feel pretty good when you can go into a day two of a tournament and say that T Tigers may have been the worst player on your team in day one <laughs> because he's another one of those players that's yeah. always yeah. stellar. But Max Green and Zio just stepped up so much yesterday. And that's the key thing. It's not like T Tigers yeah, played badly. He yeah. still played as T Tigers. It's just his team was uh, Danzio especially was just on another level. He he was playing out of his mind. I mean, the first couple of games you can see it on your screen right there, 10-0 and one on Adagio and just incredible play and towards the later stages of that series against hammers we were seeing adagio just being banned away from dnzo because hammers just didn't want to have to deal with that yeah hammers couldn't deal with that yeah that was the reason <laughs> they, they banned away because they just they didn't have an answer for dnzo's adagio and so now coming into day two is that something that sk is going to be worried about does sk feel like they have an answer for dnzo's adagio or are they going to let it through and try, you know try their luck with it or are they going to be the ones that are banning it away and having to use one of those bands on an Adagio, a pick that is not one of the highest priorities in the current meta. 
Yeah, we'll have to see how this one's going to pan out, whether that's a priority in the draft from the word go. But that is going to be your Immortals roster. Three exceptional players there. And then Excelsior as well in the background, ready to sub in if needed. But we had a few words with Immortals coming on into the tournament. Let's see whether emotions are running high, whether there's a lot of pressure on them coming into the tournament. For me personally, I like playing on stage. I feel like it motivates me to try harder and seeing all the people just watch me play makes me you know, want to prove myself even more. I think that TSM's a strong and capable team and they're definitely the favorites coming to this tourney, but I definitely think we have a chance to beat them. All the teams at this championship are way stronger than last season. If EU does beat a team, then they really have improved. And there has been some, I guess, rumors going around that EU is getting a lot better. So we just have to wait and see. Apparently there's been rumors going around that EU have been increasing in scale. Back in London, SK Gaming were the team that the North American teams were most nervous about. They were fearing coming in. We'll see how that interaction is going to play out coming onto the stage here today, Suja. Yeah, and they boot camp for a week. You can't underestimate that. A lot of teams have not spent a week to boot camp, and SK is one of those teams that are taking this seriously. They are the, maybe not the last hope, because one more matchup against TSM, but they are the, probably the most important hope for the EU region right now, and everyone needs to give them their energy. Now, there's a conversation I want to bring up before we get on into the draft of this game, and it's about SK's mentality coming into this series, because it's similar to what Jaws was talking about in one of the series earlier, where you have to come into these games not thinking, okay, I'm against this player, I'm against this player. You have to be going in thinking, okay, I am this player. It's all about SK's confidence in themselves as opposed to their confidence in their opponents. I was talking to them earlier today, and that's exactly what Bayou was saying. He wasn't about how confident is he in the matchup, it's how confident he is in SK Gaming's play. Yeah, I mean, if you show up and perform to the very best of your abilities, there's nothing, it doesn't matter who you're up against, that's the best you can do. And if you end up losing when you play to the best of your abilities, you can walk out holding your head high because, you know, hey, you give it your best shot, they were just a better team. But if you show up with the best of your abilities and you then get the win, it doesn't matter if your opponents played well or if they played poorly, you were the ones that were pushing the issue. And so often in Vainglory, we see that it is the teams that push the envelope, the teams that are making the proactive plays, trying to make the decisions, mm -hmm. and trying to set the pace and the tone of the game that more often than not end up on top. Now, Suijay, I want to bring up a topic with you. This may be a little bit painful for you, but <laughs> Immortals, as an organization, are the team that lost to an EU team back in London. Does that put a lot of pressure on these players? Like, what is the emotion going to be like within this team going into this series? Honestly, when Zeo fates a setback, it makes him stronger, if anything. He wants to prove himself, and he is probably the best laner when it comes to the live stage. And he's supported by an amazing cast. So if anything, they're going to prove themselves that, hey, that was just the fluke <laughs> last <laughs> London, and today we are going to show it. Not only that, but we heard from Zio himself. It was all because of CJ. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think, I think they have definitely moved past it at the very least. I don't think that's going to be on Dienzio's mind at all coming into this game. Uh, I think they, it's put in the past. You can't affect what's happened in the past. You just have to continue to move forward and try and improve. All right, well, jumping on into this game, that player to keep your eyes on at home is going to be Tyrus from SK Gaming. Now, Tyrus, he, across the course of this season, has been the rookie of the season. He has been an exceptional jungler. He's been incredibly influential in his games, but this is going to be his biggest test yet. He's going up against T-Tigers, a player that is renowned for his dominance, his presence in a game. Tyra's, he's got to pull, he's got to play the best he's ever played here. Yeah, he does. Tigers plays so smart. I mean, he knows the rotations down to the second, and he knows how to counter the enemy jungler when their power spikes are, when his power spikes are, and he maximizes those plays. And that's why any team that Tyrus is on just does so phenomenally well, because this man is such a good shot caller, one of the smartest, if not the smartest player in Vainglory right now. Yeah, we'll see how Tyrus is going to be able to deal with him coming on into this. And obviously, you can see a 93% kill participation, exceptional plays coming out from him across the board. And just the team play from SK is one of the things that we've always been talking about. Excited to see how he's going to do here on the stage. But let's see how he was feeling coming into the whole tournament on day number one. 
for this tournament, we uh, we had to adapt pretty much to the NA playstyle because they're even more aggressive, like uh, how they invade and, and the rotations and everything. And in EU, it's more passive, and so we had to adapt. So I kind of feel that definitely, if we can surprise any of the teams with a special comp or a special pick, that will put them off guard and and that they will not be expecting the power that the SK brings to the table. Well, it's definitely a lot harder against the NA teams than the EU teams because they are they are just more professional in the way they play and they're more aggressive. So we wanted to train in NA and we immediately saw the difference in the regions. And yeah, as uh, Raf already said, we needed to adapt to that because they like to punish mistakes. Uh, I have the feeling that I have a really aggressive playstyle and I push them and Coming up against the NA teams, uh, since they also have the aggressive playstyle, I think we should uh, have a pre pretty good chance against them. We love to play against each other because we know we are we are the top notch of Europe and we know that uh, we can go far together. Now, during that interview, we heard Kavolafar mentioning how they might have some special picks to bring on into this one. How are we expecting that one to play? Like, is that crazy? I, We've already seen a there, lot of special picks. There is something. I can almost guarantee there is something, not from talking to them, but from the way that, that smirk Kavolafar had in his face. <laughs> I have seen that smirk before a couple of times in the past. It is usually before he pulls out something absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I remember seeing it very clearly in Berlin before he pulled out the weapon power lane Lance when Lance had just been released. <laughs> I think Valifar has something extremely special planned for this day. Yeah, and they play like a weapon power Lance or a weapon power Graze, and then they get tires on a Scarf and gets him to the late game so he can then carry. You can see the combos they had with Scarf and the weapon power Graze. That burst damage, that sustained damage from Scarf worked out really, really well for them. But I'm sure this is something that Immortals is anticipating, um, but th that means SK needs to pull out something completely out of their hat to, go, to, to surprise them. They've done it before, we'll see if they're gonna be able to do it. I wanna talk about the Immortals' perspective on that though, because like, how do you, you say that Immortals are gonna be expecting this, how do you prepare for that? Because you don't, you've got no idea what it is that will be brought out. How do you get yourself ready for a situation? Well, like the that? key, when I, when I, the personal coach, we talked a lot about in the game decision making and thinking. The critical skills are so important in the game. You have to analyze their comp and understand what is their win condition, when are their power spikes, at what minute of the game do they excel and when do you want to avoid fights and then when you want to force fights. So as long as they have that conversation, if it's a brand new comp that they never played against, and they dissect that comp and break it down to its parts and look at its weaknesses and surgically yeah. exploit it, I think Immortals will do very, very well. We'll see if, we, if they can bring that to the stage now. I want to mention as well the fact that SK Gaming came here a week early before the tournament so that they could boot camp here in LA. How much do you think that kind of preparation is going to affect their play? Do we think that we're going to be seeing an SK Gaming that's totally leveled up from what we saw in the regular season? I think we're going to see an SK Gaming that's playing very different compositions from what we saw in the regular season. And it's that's going to actually be really difficult to prepare against SK Gaming because in the regular season, they had five heroes that they played 10 times or more. They were very much a team of habit. They didn't really play a whole lot of different compositions, you know, in 39 games, to have five <laughs> heroes that you've played 10 times or more, that means you're playing them a lot, just a couple of compositions a lot. All five of those heroes also had over a 60% win rate. So if you're trying to prepare against SK, you're looking at those heroes and be like, okay, this is what we want to focus on, but that SK well, is totally very likely team. not gonna be looking to run those same five heroes now. Yeah, and even things like the comfort pick of the Scarf that we've talked about a lot, that's been more leaning towards the lane now as well. So we're even seeing the same heroes used in totally different compositions in totally different ways. I mean, Suijay, talk to me a little bit about what you expect to see coming into the draft here. Because we, we've seen the meta kind of develop over the last couple of days or over the last day and a half. Do you expect these two teams to be sticking to that? Because based on what we've been talking to with SK, it seems like this is going to be a little bit different. Yeah, I think heavy CC will be very important. We've seen in the past games today, Grace, Cruel, Glaive are going to be highly contested. Um, along with CP Idris, we know that SK Kavalafar loves to play weapon or CP Idris. He plays it very, very well. Uh, so I think that in terms of the key captains will be Grace and Catherine. Um, and the key carries will be Idris and, um, and Celeste, and the junglers will be like Scarf, Glaive, and Cruel. Those are probably going to be the key meta picks. 
but then uh, we'll see it off Metapix. I'm really excited for that. Yeah, I'm very excited to see what is going to be coming through on this one. Now, before we do jump into this game, to give us a little bit extra insight on this one, we have Dan Gaskin standing by alongside Fuji. Yeah, I might be in the casting booth, but don't worry, I'm not going to be casting any Vainglory today. But somebody who is, is Fuji. And you might be saying, well, where's Fuji been? Where have you been? Right uh, here, of man. course, yeah, you're here. The whole you're time. ready. He's just been waiting in the balcony. But, <laughs> of course, you're not doing as much casting now for Vainglory. I understand That's you true. have a new position at SEMC. Talk me through that. Yeah, so I joined SEMC about two months ago officially. Uh, it has taken me away a little bit from the desk, obviously. A little bit out of the competitive scene from a player standpoint. But I get to work on esports as a whole, actually driving the future future of Vainglory, helping build the new structure, helping transition into new formats that we have coming into 2018 and beyond. So it's pretty exciting, a little behind the scenes work, but mm. I'm excited about it. So Vainglory is in very good hands now that we can see, of course. It's nice because you yeah. went from being a player mm. to then ca uh, talent and a caster, and now you're part of the actual team on the development of the game. And that's such a nice and beautiful story. Did you ever think that you'd be in this kind of position when you were just playing back in the day? I don't think so, not quite at least. I mean, I knew that I wanted to go into esports and I could start being a player. And if I could go from a player to a caster, to an org owner, to like a GM, to joining different esport organizations and really like diving into the entire structure, that I knew that the next step was being a part of a great developing team like SCMC to help grow the esport from the ground up. And you don't really want to be talking about work whilst you're at it work. is work. <laughs> work. Oh yeah, work. it's all work. But you're going to be casting the next series, Immortals versus SK. I mean, initial thoughts from you. Do you think that this is Europeans' last hope, or do you think that we're just going to see uh, an absolute, wow, mind-blowing performance from SK? I definitely think SK could take the series, but I know Immortals is really trying to prove themselves. Like both teams had some pretty hard luck in the Spring Unified Championship, so they're both on stage going head to head now. The way I've been describing it, at least, is that it's kind of the hope of EU versus the hype of NA for this matchup, so I really just want to see it go all five games. And is it a case of D'Enzio stepping up, being that live performer that we've seen? Because, I mean, we look back at London Championships, mm -hmm. and it was such a disappointment for him. He personally was very upset to be the only NA team that lost to a European team. Yeah. He's definitely not going to want that to happen again, surely. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure not. I mean, D'Enzio, like, he told us all, like, he's here to win it, and he doesn't want to lose again, especially not to an EU team. But that being said, like, this is a strong European powerhouse team, and I know these guys have been practicing so hard all year. The boot camp. I mean, if hard work is going to pay off, we're about to find out. And you, uh, obviously, I haven't had, had a chance to ask you questions about your favorite yet. I had that yesterday. I spoke to every single caster, mm. got an idea of where they were kind of putting the money out of their pocket and, and just placing the bets on. And people were hedging towards NA. Yeah. Are you thinking this is going to be a TSM kind of cloud nine situation? I would have to lean towards Immortals most likely taking the series, but that being said, it all comes down to whether or not SK can actually like pull it together and do an upset, a bit of a surprise, right? We know how strong Immortals is in the jungle and in the lane, but a lot of the time we talk about Tyrus, what can he do, what can he do? He just gets better and better. He's gonna be the key, he's gonna be the focal point for me. And then overall winner then for the entire tournament, who do you think oh, is gonna take it? the overall tournament, oh wow. I think I still might have to peg TSM for the overall winner, but I love upsets, and I do like to be wrong sometimes. I love upsets too. Let's see if the desk like upsets, because I think they're going to just dive into this one. We're almost ready for the game. So back over to you, Munchables and the boys. Thank you very much. Maybe that's the next name of our indie band, Munchable and, <laughs> and the boys. But time to get into the nitty gritty of this series once again. We should be able to get into the game any moment now, so do bear with us. Obviously, has been a couple of little technical hip hiccups across the course of today, but it seems like they're all just about resolved, so we'll be able to jump on into the games. Now, while we are waiting for this game to start, don't forget there is some competitions going on for you guys at home, and one of them is all about those statistics. Make sure to let us know what you think the most interesting statistic is. If you have access to the API, please go ahead and use that. Bring us some infographics, bring us all the cool stuff that you can and we'll be selecting a winner after the tournament is over there is a thousand ice on the line so make sure to tweet at us using the hashtag vainglory live stats and we'll be able to pick a winner out of people that have tweeted at us all of this is thanks to mad glory so make sure to go and check out their website as well so thank you very much mad glory for getting involved now before we do jump on into this game i do want to talk about immortals just a little bit more because I want to ask you guys, what is, well, not necessarily what has changed, but what needs to change for this team? Like, what is the difference between this Immortals that came into the Vainglory 8, didn't quite step up to the expectation? Like, 
What is the difference that they need to make to live up to that expectation, to live up to the hype? Yeah, I analyzed the, when they lost the challenge battles against um, Hammers. It, that's just one, we tried CP Idris because we knew how strong it was. It was something new to the team. But more importantly, they would overcommit and overextend to try to get the hyper carry. And I feel like a lot of the times they just need to focus the front line. I mean, there's so much damage and focus come on Tigers and Zio with their builds that they can just focus the front line and not try to overly risk um, diving the hyper carry. And I feel like they need to understand their win conditions and play to it. Once they do that, they, they will be successful because Zio and everyone, they get really excited. And when you get really excited, you don't think. You want to go in there and just yep. destroy everybody. And that's, Z, what, that, that's what Zio is known for. So if he doesn't do that, he'll be fine. And that actually kind of leads into my next topic as well, the idea of getting excited. We've talked about this land buff, right? We've talked about how when Zio gets on stage, when the whole Immortals roster gets on stage, they level up to a, a level of play that we don't get to see from them in the regular season. How much of that is going to play into mentality? Because obviously, if I'm Zio right now, I'm probably still riding the hype wave from yesterday's games. How do you get yourself into a, a level state so that you can perform today? I think it's so, someone like Zio has been on the stage so many times now. I don't think that's an issue for him anymore. It's just they get so much more confidence when they play on the stage because they just want to be performing. They want to be at this highest level, performing in front of as many people as possible. That extra you know, confidence and I, I, I guess you'd almost call it uh, just extra their, their charisma. The, yeah, the charisma <laughs> they have just makes them perform that little bit better. But we are into the draft for the first Ooh, game. Oh, Adagio is banned. Series. So they did Look their homework. That. The respect. SK back. did their homework. I mean, is it really homework to just watch the first day of the <laughs> live championship? I feel like that'd be some pretty great homework. So Glaive is picked up here. This leaves Catherine and Lyra open for the side of SK. So let's see what they will decide to play here because I haven't seen Rap a lot in Catherine. He actually prefers Arden and it has really a, a really solid Arden. So they may even, oh, they're going to go for Catherine actually instead of the Arden. And that means they're going to go ahead and ban away potentially um, a key. I don't think they'll take Lara away, but they'll probably ban away something that they don't want to deal with because they, they want the Cruel. So they'll force the ban of Batiste on the side of Immortals here, I believe. And they're going to ban Voxley from Zeo. There you go. And this is where Immortals now has to ban the Batiste at this point because Batiste yep. with Catherine is just way too strong mm -hmm. and this will give SK Cruel. Once, so. once that Catherine is locked in, you don't have a choice about banning that Batiste. And as you rightly say, the Cruel coming in, that is two incredibly powerful picks coming through for SK Gaming. When we talk about this North American meta, these are two of the top picks. Yeah, and again, going back to SK and the way they played in the regular season, and I talked about those heroes that they have 10 plus games on, they have a combined one game with Kroll and Catherine. They had played one game on Catherine, did not play a single game of Kroll in the regular season. So SK obviously has adapted in the time since the end of the regular season and today. Yeah, as you were saying before, we're gonna be seeing a different SK game coming onto the stage here. And we'll see whether that's a better change or a worse one. We'll have to find out. Immortals looking towards their final pick. What do you expect to see here, Suijay? Yeah, I think for here, they could go potentially just take away the Celeste pick for the Kitsada SK or just go with CP Idris. And Again, CP Idris is a mage. They should not dive with him. They should let him stack and poke, etc., and then go in when he has enough stacks. Because he can actually blow up a Cruel pretty quickly with the amount of burst damage. And actually, Zio's going to pick the Scarf instead here. Scarf with the Glaive and the Lance. All right. So kind of, I feel like the Scarf is always like an EU pick historically. So it's interesting to see them picking that up against a player like Tyrus, who's played it so much during the regular season. It's almost like the draft has been flipped on its head here. Now looking towards SK Gaming, how do you round out this composition? I mean, they, Idris. Yeah, Idris or the Celeste. You could go with either one of them, but I feel like Idris just makes a lot of sense. It was a very common pick for them. It was one of their most played heroes. It was one they had the highest win rate on of those five as well. Uh, so it's one that they definitely would feel comfortable with. And again, it's another one of these massive power picks that we've been talking about in this current match. Idris is kind of coming to his own with the CP laners heading towards the lane, but it's going to be Celeste coming on oh, through wow. instead. Not wanting to lean towards the Idris. I, honestly, I think this might be the first time Idris has made it all the way through trap without being picked or banned. But Celeste definitely has been having a great time during this championship. Yeah, this is a triple stun composition, so Immortals will need to play very carefully. They need to engage against this comp, because if a calf engages with the stun and the crew engages, that's going to put them in a tough side. You want them to use their stuns defensively, so they need to be proactive and engage and force fights in jungle. Jungle is the place to fight because they have Lance.
Yeah. And that's been a conversation across the course. Today. Yeah, against the Lance and Glaive, we saw earlier Truth being able to use those core collapses in order to shut down the Glaive. But if they are using those stuns to try and stop the Glaive, that means Scarf is going to be untouched on the back line. So a lot of decisions will have to be made by SK on when they use their crowd control. All right, well, we'll see whether they're going to be able to use that effectively. You could hear the crowd behind me getting hyped for this game. This this is one of the most hyped matchups of today. You've got the EU Hope in SK Gaming going up the North Ameri going up against the North American Hype in Immortals. This is going to be an incredible series. I cannot wait to get on into this one. We've got the compositions locked in. I'm curious to see how SK are going to be able to play around this scarf, considering it's something they're usually playing alongside. You feel like they probably are going to know how to play against the composition. Yeah, but like Lance this. just counters Captain Crow completely. I mean, if as long as he holds a gift in wall and just pushes Captain Crow off the scarf and then Glaive can also peel, they're actually in a good spot. All right, well, we'll see whether they can pull that one off. It's time to get on into this game. It's time to head into the third quarterfinal of today and pass it over to our casters. SK Gaming versus Immortals plus Fuji casting the game. This is a real treat. Fuji, how you feeling? I mean, I feel great, but the real treat is casting with you, Humanist. Oh, man. It's, it's been too my long, heart. man. It's been too long. I'm so excited to be here, though. This is going to be my personal favorite matchup of the day. Can't wait to see it go down. Absolutely, I've been looking forward to this. Both of these teams bring really interesting things to the table. They're both very aggressive mechanically. Uh, strategically, they bring a lot to the table. So I expect that this is not going to be a sweep, whatever happens. I don't think it is. I think it's going to really be neck and neck. But honestly, just seeing it, the Enzio, Tiggs on the same team, all on the stage at the same time, this is going to be hype. Hype, hype, hype. The crowd's starting to get hyped up here. And ladies and gentlemen, we have loaded into the house the unfold to let the games begin. I'm really curious to see if we actually kick off with uh, early aggression, maybe some fighting even before these guys look for rotations here early on. Maybe a bit of a technical issue as we get into this. But Fuji, how would you expect with these drafts the early game to be playing out? I mean, I honestly don't expect anything less than aggression when we talk about Immortals. Like, T-Tigers, he is the definition of aggression, right? Like, when we talk about this guy in North American scene, everyone respects him, what he's capable of. A lot of his name came in the early Kashka days when he was so powerful on that pick, and he really just set the precedence for that in North America. What I really like about Tigers, T-Tigers as well, is that, yeah, he's, he's bringing the aggression, but he, he seems to always be like a step ahead, right? It's not unchecked aggression. He, he's always thought it out in advance, and not only is he doing that, oftentimes he's telling his teammates what he's doing, so they're one step ahead as well. Yeah, I mean, you can't just dive for the sake of diving, right? Like, I mean, trading kills You can. Like, I mean, you could. <laughs> I, sometimes I do. I mean, sometimes, yeah, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, when we talk about this type of tempered aggression, where you're able to go in and secure the kills, and the thing we hammer on over and over again is it's not just about securing the kill, it's about getting an objective afterwards. There always needs to be a means to an end. You could technically end an entire game without killing anybody. You gotta get the vein crystal down, but oftentimes there has to be blood on some people hands. T-Tigers has never shied away from taking that. Well, let's see what these guys can do. Also, you know, Kay Volifar is in here. He, he's one of the, the big laners that we've seen have huge successes. And these guys, they talked about having something special, you know, catching their opponents off guard. Now, it's not too crazy what they've drafted up here. But do you think they have any surprises in the way they're going to execute it? I definitely feel like SK wants to come out a little safe early on. They need to test the waters, right? They need to yeah. figure out how strong actually is Immortals. Because, yes, the Immortals, we know they're strong in North America, but they didn't get a lot of face time. They came up out of the Challenger scene. It just got a few weeks that got them to this championship. Just so. soaring up the ranks, though. Just gaining points week after week just, once just they got crushing in. crushing it, right? Yeah. Like, so we know they're strong, at least in that small window. We saw their performance yesterday as well. Dienzio just absolutely showing up in such a big way. But North America, they respected SK during spring. They're going to have to continue to do the same thing here. They were the only European team to take a game off of Cloud9. In fact, the only other team to take a game off of Cloud9 that tournament was TSM. And it was just one for each. So the storyline here for them is quite exciting. And Tyrus right there, I mean, this guy, he's the one I'm going to be watching, Humanist. And it's not just because of his hair. <laughs> it's not just because of the hair or that, that wonderful chain that he's got there. He said his mom actually made that one for him. I think that was pretty cool. But look, guys, we are into the game right now. And this looks like Raph up in the tri brush. He will notice the Max Green and D'Enzio are rotating over early. Zio, of course, on that scarf. Really excited to see what he'll do. He says, Yo, one of my favorite scarves of all time. Looks like they should be able to take the mids away. It's actually stolen by Raph. A nice job. 
I mean, I, this is such a big deal this early in the game, the experience, the gold coming out of the jungle. But uh, DNZO playing with his food here a little bit. The last time we actually saw DNZO on some epic Scarf performances, most memorable was at Worlds. It almost pulled them through the semis into the final, so I'm also quite excited to see this pick. Yeah, this was like, this was the power pick that would come out uh, and put so much fear into his opponents. Now, we have the Celeste versus the Scarf. Actually, maybe a little bit of aggression. T-Tigers boots in, trying to get the afterburn. Not quite where he wanted to be. And that's going to be a swing and a miss here, Fuji. Yeah, you can't punt the turret, T-Tigers, but I think he knows that. He's just going to give it a little love tap back up. It'd be a fun home. mode, though. <laughs> it would be a fun mode, indeed. You know, so the first thing you asked me was, will we see any aggression? Right away, we see Max and, and Scarf just invading and giving Tigers some time Blast, the back. Helio, a couple of attacks. You see Cave all of our mechanics very clean. You know what? I love the fact these guys aren't waiting to do damage. A lot of times you get mages in the lane. They spend a lot of time farming. But Cabela Far, he's, he's trying to tell us. He's like, hey, we're not here to play. We're here to win. And they're trying to get the kill on Dienzio right away. I think the play style of Celeste and Scarf oftentimes, you, you know, obviously you have to do different things. But a lot of times you're hanging on the backside of fights trying to apply damage. Stack up a broken myth eventually once you get it. How do we expect the, the lane to actually work out here, though? I honestly think it just needs to be a very safe laning phase. We're going to want Tyrus to get level 6, be able to throw from Hell's Heart, lock down the Scarf so he can't do anything. They might try a couple of cheeky ganks here. Honestly, the stun, the follow-up from the slow, from the passive will give them some damage. Yeah, Tyrus moving up, just getting a little damage down on the max screen. He's, he's cleared out his jungle. He's making the rotation. It's actually Tix taking his fronts away. Tyrus is down here. I'm not sure if he actually saw that. Yeah, I don't think he did. I mean, every little bit counts, but the front's not quite as worth getting the Elder, but T-Tigers, they do have some vision on the jungle there, so looking for perhaps a counter gank here, but SK Gaming, they're playing smart. They understand Immortals is an aggressive team. They will push. They will make their presence known early game. We have to play back just long enough before we can group up. Uh, T-Tigers, he's caught out here a little bit, but being the Glaive, of course, after going over the wall, he'll probably pour it back. We see aggression up in the lane, though. The MPLK Volvar getting lit up. The attack, the Goop drops down at first blood. Um, Immortals are on the board. First blood, two Immortals. I love the fact we see action on two sides of the map, except Celeste does not have an afterburn, can't get out of there, does go down. Great impel from Max, a great follow-up there from the DNZO. So, Immortals putting a point on the board, setting the tone. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Kevalovar is going to be missing some of those lane minions just because it was underneath the turret when he died. I think Rap cleaned up maybe one or two of those up in the lane. I like looking at some of the build progression we're going as well. T-Tiger's looking at, he's going to be rushing the Tension Bow. That's going to be quite a lot of damage in the early game. It's going to last quite throughout the game too. Is Celeste, you really want to get to those offensive items. You do not want to build defense. She's going to have to watch out here. T-Tiger's looking for blood. T-Tiger, oh no! T-Tiger's core collapse. It is a disaster for T-Tiger's. He goes down as well. Rap goes down to the impale. Max Green turning it up. Tyrus is up in the lane as well, Fuji. Tyrus looking for something, not gonna find anything, but uh, Mortals SK trading. I thought I told you, Tiggs. You can't punt the turret. <laughs> <I don't laughs> he, he didn't listen, didn't listen He was at all. trying to prove you wrong. Cave Alvar getting impaled up. Dienzio eating those Heliogenesis, though. I mean, you can see Cave Alvar just standing his ground. I really like it. Even though he was impaled, he's like, I'm just gonna get the damage down on Zio. We do have a little bit of a question we have to ask here. A little time perhaps being wasted on this Kroll. He might be able to get some counter jungling in. We'll have to see if he can take this away from Tiggs. Uh, Tyrus, actually, yeah, Tyrus got it. So the time in the lane was worth it. You gotta be careful though, spending too much time up there, putting pressure in the lane if you're not farming and not getting your rotations in. Not going to reach those item spikes quite as fast, but speaking of item spike, Tiggs does have this tension bow. We'll be looking for a kill soon. Max Green here has enough money to buy the fountain. We'll probably move into that as well. And of course, Dienzio sitting on that frost burn. So a lot of tier three item completions for immortals here. SK still trying to get to theirs. We're in a pretty good spot right here, the Humanist. This is the moment where we're going to start seeing, can SK actually get the kill? We have the Merciless Pursuit. We have from Hell's Heart. If they get a lockdown on Clave or Scarf, it's probably game over. Yeah, I mean, the, the item spikes are one thing, but having that from Hell's Heart just changes the game. If the Kroll can move up, they don't have vision on him, and he lands that. Zeo can be in a world of hurt right now. Tyrus has moved up to the lane. Flares are out. Max throws his own flare. Tires moving forward, controlling the brush. SK doing a good job to have a forward positioning in the lane consistently here. Yeah, going for the counter jungle again. Well, he gets it, gets it as well. Gets it again, stunned up. Tyrus getting a couple uh, weakness stacks there. Max Green's dropped down. Zeo as well. Got spit fire the goop onto two. Keep all of our booting forward, though. This is actually T-Tigers taking the majority of damage. A defensive afterburn forced out. Max Green is there. Both teams 
Well, it's actually only Immortals forced out with the found there. Raph holding his. Yeah, I like the fact that there was just a little gentleman sparring there, and obviously we saw Kavalfar using his boot active to come to the rescue, getting the core collapse down, keeping his teammates safe. But SK knows they have to have seen the fountain. They could actually look to make a play here, but since they weren't able to nail it in lane, they did have to use from Hell's Heart in the jungle, didn't get a kill. It looks like it's just going to be a pretty big reset. Now, the, the mini wave is moving forward, and we had Kevalfar drop into the jungle to split that farm, so a bit unfortunate there, just because I think the Scarf can clear that wave so fast, it's, it's gonna be hard for them to do that. Yeah, you gotta be careful about doing double jungle rotations with your carries if your captain cannot hold the lane safely. Immortals doing the smart thing, not letting the wave stall out, pushing it all the way to the turret is what they should be doing, but Tyrus going in for the counter jungle again. Tyrus moving forward. He's got that dead man's rush. Just kind of flexing on Max there. Key Tigers has got the apps for it. Nox gave all four back, but where's the follow? There's the impale scoop. Whoa! Lit him up! He just got popped right there. Now Tyrus is going to be forced out. And the Wrath left to his own devices, but this is going to be Immortals applying some pressure. Oh, the impale on the goop feels good if you're Immortals. You're slowed, you are stunned, you cannot move, you cannot get out of that in the fire. The, the ticking damage is overwhelming, and we're going to see right here just the power of Scarf's ability to take down objectives as well with this burn over time. Wow, I mean, th that is an early kill. The transition is right into a turret. You talked about it before. The top teams are always taking something off the back of a fight, and you don't have to kill two or three members. That, that is one kill, one turret. One kill, one turret. I'm sure they would like to continue that trend throughout this game. Tyrus just uh, telling the gold miner, come over here, buddy. This might be a little bit risky because Immortals is able to contest this. Well, this is going to be a sketchy situation. Zeal Immense holding the Spitfire. Oh, nice. Collecting. SK. Able to grab that, and it felt like Zeal might be able to steal it, but a little bit late. A little bit late. Also, Glaive was not close enough for Afterburn Threat. I like the fact that SK, even though they just lost an objective, they immediately, they looked for the next one. They didn't let it get him down. They're like, okay, we're a little behind, but we definitely need to make the next move. Turret, too protected. Let's go for the gold mine. Let's take the trade, and they secure it. Yeah, the, uh, the worst thing you can do is start to feel like, okay, we're behind. We're going to start to pull back on the map. They have reached out. They have taken an objective and keep themselves quite in this game. It's three to one, eight minutes in. SK down just a little bit. Core collapse, lands on to Max. SK moving forward, Tyrus flying a bit of damage. Spitfires flying from Zeo, consistently coming out here. Right now, they have such good wave clear that SK are pretty much on the back foot consistently without that turret up. Yeah, makes sense, but mistakes are going to be punished so hard against the SK gaming team. They have so many stuns, so many abilities to lock you down, so if Max needs to make sure those entails land, or else he's just a sitting duck for that team. Tyrus is sitting over in the corner here. I like this. Krolls, they want to sit back, they want to get their speed boost in the brush a little bit out of sight. Unpredictable, but with him returning home, they're going to be able to do some counter jungling themselves. Yeah, they'll take away the front half of this jungle from SK Gaming. And I'm sitting here wondering, you know, why is Tyrus feeling like he's not having too big of an impact thus far in the game? I think it's just because the, like, so they obviously had a lot of incentive to do counter jungling. I think the first time they went in for the invade, it was great. The second time they went in, it was great. But you can't keep doing the same thing. Immortals was there to contest, to hold off instead. They should have went for the lane gank. They should have went for the pressure with the ultimate on Kroll. But it's okay. They still have a good hold on the game. And this is also a little bit of a risky play here from Immortals. Ooh, Crystal Sentry dropping Crystal down low. Sentry SK trying defeated. to defend. Crystal Sentry's down. T-Tigers is low. Zero as well. Solar Storm flying through and they're actually going to take T-Tigers out. Tyrus moving forward. A nice job there. Great Solar Storm from Celeste, but Max Green, this is the Summer Unified Championships, friend. No Crucible use, no Fountain use. You can't just let T-Tigers go down like that. He's critical to protecting this Scarf. Yeah, well, it looks like we're going to take a moment here. Maybe there's something going on. Uh, Max Green, I, I, I would expect him to be landing. Of, it, it, you, I would put him in the top three captains potentially here at this championship. He's really impressed me uh, as I've seen him play more and more. And he's one of these guys I would expect to be landing crucibles and getting that fountain out. I would have to think that you know, players love testing the limits, right? So he had to think if he can body block at least the two other stars, that the primary star in the middle wouldn't be quite enough damage yeah. to take Glaive down. And it just was. Like the calculation yeah. was just a little bit off. That can happen. Nerves on stage. So holding those active items. Did you see if the From Hell's Heart actually caught him or did it catch Ticks? I don't believe it did, no. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was one of these things where it was like, you have the damage, you have the ability to body block something, but you have to make the decision in the moment, especially if you've got two ults coming from two different directions, like which one do you actually catch? Better safe than sorry, just pop the Crucible, you know you're gonna get out there, you yeah. can just wait for the cooldown and reset. Yeah, well, these guys having a little bit of a chat there. 
Zio having a pretty good game thus far. I think Immortals uh, have control of this game. They've moved the, uh, their vision forward across the map. That's an important thing we talk about once a turret goes down. Um, and that gives them so much control. I, you know, if you're against uh, an invisible here, maybe a CP Kestrel, a Taka, that's very important, but also against a Kroll, right? Like, you never want to have him just moving freely across the map. Well, it's basically like two wins, right? You're pushing up your vision, you get a lot of information on those heroes that like to be stealth or like to be in the brush, but you're just also getting all the vision information anyway. You're getting items that are being picked up, you're getting a lead on what your enemy's attempting to do, and it just allows you to set up so many more strategic plays. And these guys, I mean, they've been in the scene for a while. Like, we see Dnzo on screen, like, this guy has literally grown up in Vainglory to see him here on stage today helping lead his team to victory is quite the treat. Yeah, literally growing up, he's like a foot taller than when I met him. <laughs> SK moving forward here. Stun is going to come out on the max court. Collapse nice dodged dodge. out with a nice combat roll there. Dienzio the feeling the pressure, but T-Tiger is coming around from the bottom side. Tyrus scouts that out. He's empowered here in the brush. Potentially looking for a target, waiting for the cooldown on the ultimate. Solar Storm on cooldown as well. SK drops down into the jungle. Looks like Immortals not ready to follow. Definitely smart move there from Immortals. You don't want to fight in that choke point, in that angle against the Celeste. Even though you do have the Lance, you prefer jungle fighting. A north to south angle is not optimal. Celeste definitely gets the position down towards the shop. She can run out towards her base. So I like the fact that Immortals held off. You saw they were thinking about it. But uh, one of those things though I want to think about a little bit here is the fact that we see how much pressure SK has once they're in the lane brush. Even though Immortals' turret is right there, they know they can't enter the bush because a stun from Catherine, a follow-up from Kroll, a core collapse from Celeste, it doesn't matter how much defense you have, that's going to be devastating to your team. Yeah, one of the things, Fuji, I'm actually noticing right now is so K. Volifar going for the level 8 infusion. On the flip side, we look at Zio, and he's completed three tier 3 items. So he has a pretty significant advantage there. I mean, everyone wants to rush those tier 3 items. If you talk to any team right now, they say if you're on Scarf, if you're on Celeste, you have to get your offensive items as fast as possible. You only get the defense necessary. I would say Reflex Block is necessary. There's often times where you certainly want more than one, though, against that type of composition. But that's just the strength of these types of players. Humanists, that's what they want to do. They want to optimize their offensive pass so they can do as much damage, hit those power spikes when they need to hit them, and three items scarf. I mean, we're one item away from one of the most powerful late game heroes in the entire game Ooh. already. Ooh. Gives me the shivers. All these guys taking another moment here. And uh, I got to wonder, if you were actually on SK's team as you know the shot caller for them, they're on the back foot here. It looks like the wind's a little bit out of their sails. We're, we're looking at them here on camera. What are you telling your teammates? Hold on. That's what you tell them. You tell them, hold on, because Catherine right now is one of the most powerful scaling captains in the game. Once you get that echo, especially if you get a null wave, mm -hmm. you can shut down the enemy captain, no actives available, use your first silence, echo, force the crucible out on the second silence, giving, I mean, that's just one hero causing so much mayhem. So Celeste is able to just continue to drop volleys from the back with those heliogenesis. But they need to get to that point. Because they are behind, they cannot afford to rush or push too early. One mistake is going to net another turret for Immortals, which is just going to increase that gold lead. I'm scared that they may not get to that point, though. I mean, it, oftentimes when you, you find yourself behind, you think, okay, maybe we're going to let the captain sit here, hold lane. We definitely are going to try and get this gold onto our Celeste. She's, she's an item behind at this point. But do you think maybe it's worth prioritizing? The thing is, is, Celeste can actually defend, especially at the choke point turret, so well. Like, the siege, sieging against the Celeste is so hard because those supernovas, when they explode, they just they hit all your team. They trigger your team a little bit. It's like, whoa, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> yeah. Yowza. Is that, that's the word you like. Exactly. But you just, I think they use that to their advantage. If you get too close, you just throw from Hell's Heart. You lock them down once again with the Catherine stun, and they have to back up. So Kraken, I believe, is the next objective that Immortals is going to be really thinking about. Because Kraken, with Scarf, that's just instant turret death. They're going to be able to push in and siege so well. Kat, even though we talked about Catherine Celeste's ability to defend, the Kraken is just a huge objective in the way from them being able to do it. Oh, yeah. I mean, being on that scarf, having the Kraken in front of you, that's one of the easiest things. The max, max range Spitfires max if you can. Range. Throwing it from uh, sneaky little angles. Drop a goop if they start to run at you. 
SK, they're in a tough place here. They are in a tough place, but if any team is going to be able to come out of a tough place, I have faith it is SK Gaming. These guys are calm and collected. We rarely ever see them shaken. Even in the moments where they're being defeated or they are falling behind, they still have such great resolve. This team is very mature. Everyone has such great respect for them for their gameplay, but honestly, they also have to respect the fact that their demeanor on stage is quite impressive as well. Yeah, I'm very impressed with this team, and uh, I'm impressed we are back into the game. Let's see what uh, SK SK Gaming can do here. They're kind of in the middle area of the map. Tyrus clearing out some scout traps here. I just love watching Tyrus on this crawl. He's just constantly just scooting around the map on this skin. It's a, such a great look. He's yeah. Just, no fear right now. The dude's just cruising through the lane, just trying to check out what's going on while his team does go down the shop. But once again, you know, SK. They are behind, but it's it's so insignificant. Like the gold lead right now for Immortals, it's mostly just the fact that they have more map presence. But right. even with the turret down, humans, SK is still pushing Immortals onto their side of the map. Yeah, it's true. And, I, and Gold Miner is essentially full at this point. The Gold Miner is full. So if they can find the kill, they can start to close the gap even more. Combat roll is going to go over the wall. Rap finding a stun. Another stack on the captain of the guard. SK as three, and it looks like they're actually going to go for the Gold Miner right here, right now. Yeah, they're gonna force this gold mine fight out. We do have Tiggs and the rest of the team coming from the uh -oh. backside. Oh, they're flying. That's gonna be a from hell's heart on Zio, stunning up potentially. The gold miner still in this fight. Hey, ball of our winds up the solar storm connecting. T Tigers is melted down. SK able to find a kill there, and they may be able to hold this gold miner and actually take it. Zio knows what's happening, throwing the spin fires. A nice uh, pre preemptive uh, core collapse coming out of K Ball of I actually really like that. I mean, from hell's heart went out right away. Caught the end, Zio. Uh, Tyrus. <laughs> <laughs> Right there. Hello. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be careful in that goop when it's ignited underneath that turret. It's a dangerous place to be. Yeah, but we saw Tyrus actually throwing Hell's Heart out, hitting Dienzios, keeping Scar from actually being able to enter that team fight just long enough. I mean, the damage coming from Tension Bow, the Twisted Stroke crit with Sorrow Blade did do quite a lot to Kavalfar, but once again, so much lockdown, it's so hard for Glaive to be able to follow up on the Celeste kill. So Tyrus connected on that from Hell's Heart. Zio get stunned up there. Was he holding reflex for something else? I honestly just think he wasn't expecting it to come out from the gold mine. Like, yeah. to, like the throw from Hell's Heart that early just to make sure they could see either secure the objective or choose to turn, it was really smart. And honestly, I wasn't even expecting it to come out. So I think that was a very heads up play from Tyrus there on this pick. Kroll just making so many waves, a hero that oftentimes is being regarded for so many of our players as just being this nightmare hero, but he didn't see that much competitive play for such a long time, but now he is just in every game, and when he is in the game, he's being felt. It's just, it's crazy to see how well these players are also pulling him off. Yeah, it's really cool. You see Tyrus just abusing the movement speed, uh, and of course the slow coming out of that uh, Shadow Empowers thing. Now, what I like to see about Tyrus, and our analyst desk actually mentioned it as well, this guy, he's a very smart player mechanically, gifted as well. But oftentimes, it's like we can watch him adapt in real time to his opponent's play style. And I think that really separates a lot of the top players. Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, it's one of these things where we talk a lot about the strength of the individuals, but it all comes down to the strength of the team. Mortals looking to position themselves here, potentially for a team fight. Max Green just chipping a little off the stone wall there. But uh, the positioning right now to be very safe. Man, MPL coming out. A defensive core collapse will cancel that off. Just not really in a position to make any moves. I actually think Immortals is not really getting anything here. They should just let the wave crash. There's no objective to be had on the map. Play safe, don't force anything. If you give a gold lead over to SK, the same thing is relevant for that Celeste pick. She does scale quite heavily into the late game, but these guys just poking at each other. I, I, I am loving Cave all of our Celeste right now. Like, even though he's missing of the majority of core collapses he's throwing, they're they're predictive of the movement of mortal like if they engage they're engaging into a core collapse um it, it, it's keeping them very safe now another mpl coming out of max screen max has done a great job to be the front line for his team thus far i mean honestly with spitfires and helios coming out it's hard to even know when to talk about the game or when to talk about the fight you just never know when the engage is coming the damage in the poke is real in this matchup. The other thing people have to also remember is that not every heliogenesis being put on the ground is being put for damage, right? It does give vision, it does give zoning. Yeah. So you can actually cut off a lot of different paths. You can drop them in the choke point up in the lane. So people are actually, they have to make a choice. Do we just walk through it and hope he's not looking? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Baltimore, don't pop it, buddy. I don't want to take that damage, but uh, it is a risk that you have to take to be able to get in the right position. 
Max and T Tigers will be quite a bit tanky, oh. so it's mostly DNZO that needs to watch out for the damage. This is one of the first times Tyrus was able to get into that top brush, I think undetected, but Immortal's not even in danger. They're dropping down as a unit down towards the middle area of the map. Now, we also have Kraken out on the map. How does this change things? It just honestly just puts another objective that teams are going to want to look for. I mean, the pace of the game is moving slow. We talked about it, right? What does SK need to do to make sure that this first turret going down doesn't spell the end of the game for them? They need to be patient. They need to play the waiting game. We have an Echo on Catherine, ready to use an Echo on Max Green, ready to use a little bit of a uh, little Echo Echo there. Echo Echo Echo. Right now, Zio, he has four offensive items. A nice uh, dodge on the impale there. Max taking a bit of damage. He should be just fine, though. Tyrus is empowered up in they that back rush there. there. They're going to move in. Max, he's slowed up. A couple weakness stacks. They're moving forward. A nice get the wall. Spitfire connects onto Tyrus. Zeal is going to look to kite back as Cave Volifar continues to drop the Heliogenesis, just, just zoning this scarf back. Yeah, but it is a four item offensive scarf build on DNZO right now, so they have to be careful. It's essentially a poke war. We have Frostburns, Eves, Broken Myths, Clockworks, all around the boots, reflex. These guys are basically saying, may the best hero and player win. I got your build, you got mine. Let's do it. I I'm loving this right now. Okay, Volfar, tier two boots, though. So Oh. Maybe a bit of an advantage. A bit of an advantage. DNZO, you got some money in the bank, kid. Yeah, just go back and spend it. It's okay. I won't tell mom. Sure. We have a lot of things to think about, though, here, Humanists, because we are getting to that 18-minute breaking point. We talk a lot about mages in the late game, the fact that they are so hard to deal with, but each team has one. So a lot of this is going to come down to the captains. We may have an actual fight. If this feels like a fight happening here, Max Green, combat rolling back. The four collapse did connect. SK. Hiding backwards, continuously dropping those Helios. Zeo kind of moving back while throwing his Spitfires, throwing one uh, backwards there. It happens. See Pyrus on the front side. Oop, another impale in the choke point. Not where you need to be back screen. Dropping low Crucible. The bounce. He stays alive. Blast Timber coming through. Tyrus continuing to get Weedy stacked. The Dragon Breath burning him down. He's got one. Moving on the top side. T Tigers on the game. Falling far. T Tigers can he take him. It's a able to get him double kill. Comes out for Immortals. Blowing this game wide open. Oh my goodness, Humanist, the ace. This is exactly what Immortals needed to win this game. They needed to get the Kraken to be able to push. Now SK Gaming, they're so dangerous for them at this point. They're going to get the second turret. They're going to put damage on the third turret. Oh my goodness, in this replay, we're going to see exactly what went down. The impale into the goop, blocking everything up. So much damage putting into Max Green. The NCO just sitting on the back line, just free of all damage output, even though the core collapse is able to go down and the supernova is able to do damage. By then, Max Green and T Tigers had already cleaned up the rest of the team fight. So we saw Tyrus actually lock on the T Tigers there. Um, I didn't notice if he had, didn't have boot cooldown or, or whatever was happening. Would, would you like to see him get off to Zeo there? Honestly, Scarf has, has to be your target. Like, if you kill Glaive, if you kill Lance, it doesn't matter because by then Scarf's going to be a max stacks and he's just going to use his ultimate and melt you. I mean, we DNZO maxes ultimate. This is maximum pierce, maximum damage output. And now we have a Kraken pushing into the base with only two turrets left. Dangerous situation, impale, core collapse. He's going to defend off a of T Tigers. This man, T Tigers has massive damage output. Another Gimpian wall, another Gimpian wall, another impale. Who is this guy? Max Green making the plays for Immortals. Zeo cleaning up with the Spitfires and the damage. And I'm telling you, Fuge, this looks like this is going to be game one going to Immortal for this race. Kraken still marching for it. Quite healthy. Ultimate. It's going to be Cave Olifar looking for a key time. Oh, the Dragon's Breath going for it. Solo Storm comes through. This is Zeo versus Cave Olifar. Cave Olifar dropping low. Core Collapse blocked off. Zeo's doing it. Zeo has done it. Immortals will be taking game one. SK almost making the defense there at the end. We knew this game was going to come down to the wire. I mean, it was actually very close as far as you look at the, the overall net worth, but Immortals didn't lose a turret. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the patience the, the displayed by both of these teams to break open the entire game after one team fight, and I said it, we have to watch the captains and Max Green coming up absolutely oh. huge during that push. Lockdown after lockdown after lockdown, even pushing them up against their own Vang Crystal. Max Green. He looks so chill. He's like, you know what? It's just another day. We're getting the maximum green out of him today. I, I am really excited about this guy and his future in being glory. Very impressive stuff here. And a lot of it coming down to just that chain lockdown. The echo, a beautiful thing. I mean, the impale into the Githian wall. Githian wall.
into another impale. <laughs> a beautiful thing. Let's see what our analysts have to say about that one. We'll go ahead and throw it over to the desk. Max Green had absolutely no mercy on the Lance in that last fight. The Echo Lance getting two <laughs> Gideon walls in a row, <laughs> just locking everybody out of the fight. Humanist started to sound a little bit like DJ Khaled up there. Another one, another one. <laughs> it was absolutely insane. Max Green is becoming a massive star in vainglory Ooh, for this immortal is. squad. He certainly is. You can see how high everyone is getting behind us for the immortals. They're one zero up in the series. Sweet Jake, talk to me a little bit about Max Green. Obviously, you yeah, worked with him a lot. Yeah, I did. Max was actually a nemesis as a casual player. Then he came to Hammers when I joined Hammers, and then he came to Immortals. And he was just a sleeping giant. I mean, I'm so proud of how far he's gone. And it's amazing to see his growth, and he's going to be the best captain, I think, in the world. He has that potential and that ability, because he's such a smart kid. Um, and with Zeo, oh my god, did you see that play he made with Zeo when the goop came down and the root? I mean, they played it really well, though. They, they, knew, they knew they needed to initiate, and they needed to combo their abilities. Because against a CC yeah. comp, if you let them initiate you, it's going to be a, a lot harder. And this is a beautiful fight there. Max baits everyone out fountains, blocks everything he needs to, and then baits it on Zeo, just lands the... the uh, Dragon's Beth onto the enemy team and wins this fight here. Yeah, that was the moment at which the games became Immortals game. Up to that point, it was very even. The fights were going both ways, but then once they managed to win that fight in the jungle, everything was wide open for the take. Yeah, it felt like the teams were doing maybe a little bit of a feeling out period <laughs> as this insane lockdown. I mean, we're, we're talking about SK who had a lockdown composition getting completely locked down by one member of Immortals <laughs> for multiple seconds. It was absolutely nuts, but like like I said, it, it felt like in the middle of this game, there was a, a bit of a feeling out period. Both of these teams respecting each other, knowing that their opposition is capable of turning the game at any minute, but it was Immortals that were able to finally pull the trigger. And you can see the mechanics, and, and like I said, like IMT has better mechanics in almost every single role, and they showed that against a CC comp, and a team as good as SK, like that's not downplay them, they're an amazing team, and they were able to play around this yeah. highly CC composition. Yeah. <laughs> D'Enzio sitting there watching his highlights on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> can't blame him. He can't blame him at all. He certainly played out of his mind in that game. D'Enzio has been on point this entire tournament so far. He's been playing exceptionally. And I don't want to take anything away from SK in that game. It's not like they played badly or anything like that. But we mentioned right before the game started, this was a situation where Immortals, they had to be the ones engaging. They couldn't allow SK to use that CC aggressively it had to be defensive that's exactly what we saw yeah exactly and and I love how Immortals kind of baited them into the jungle fight I mean that's exactly their win condition and that one key fight in jungle is what led to the crack and take and then the, uh, finishing the game and Zeo actually was ahead of Kavalafar and CS he got his broken myth first he, he did infuse a little bit more than Kavalafar though and they didn't do anything with those infusions so that did worry me a little bit but other than that, they played the competition really well and didn't get CC'd as much. Tigers, on the other hand, did get locked on. He was a guy always jumping in and kind of absorbing all the damage. Yeah, for sure. He was always in that front line, always making sure that Zio could kind of do his <laughs> thing on the back, build up those broken <laughs> mid stacks. And then those Dragon's Breath in the last two fights were just devastating for the likes of SK. And that means Immortals are now going to be 1-0 up in this series. Fantastic start to the series from them. But I want to talk a little bit about the compositions in that one because it definitely felt like SK were on the more NA-style composition coming into this one. So it's interesting to see everything kind of switching up a little bit here with the meta. And like, I'm curious to see what you guys think about the upcoming drafts, whether we're going to see very similar things in, in these next couple of drafts here. Yeah, big thing is, like I said, Lance counters Cruel and Cat. The reason why Cruel fell off the meta was Lance came into the meta, and everyone played Lance, and he just fell off and no one played him. And then now, because Cruel is such a big meta priority in the jungle, you see Lance popping up and being so successful. And you can see a really good Lance player like Gabe or Max Green, they literally carry and make plays for days. Yeah, I've got to say, Max Green has absolutely blown my mind in that last game. He played so beautifully on the Lance. Can't wait to see what the compositions are going to be coming into this second game of this series and what SK have up their sleeves to pull themselves back into the series. Let's remember, during the interview, Kavolafar was talking about they have some interesting stuff up their <laughs> sleeves there's gonna be some interesting picks I'm curious to see what that's gonna be yeah you gotta wonder when they're gonna pull that out because obviously you'd like to save a pocket pick until day three if you can but you some maybe sometimes you have to use those pocket picks to get yourself to day three so 
Uh, I, I feel like this next game may be a little bit more standard still, yep. and once their backs are against the wall, that's when some of these stranger picks may come out. I just want to point out something I saw on camera just there. Over on the SK Gaming side of things, you could see, I didn't actually quite catch which of the players it was, but one of them kind of dancing around a little bit there. Hopes are <laughs> obviously still high within the SK Gaming yeah. camp. This isn't a, a matter of, you know, losing one game and then tilting and ending up losing the series. They, they're very clearly still on board with things, still feeling good about the series. Yeah, and they have to. They got to keep their hopes up. They can't tilt. And I think SK is a team that doesn't easily tilt. They're very confident. They did some amazing plays, especially in the mid and early game against Immortals. And it was a very, very even match. I mean, they weren't, they weren't behind um, dramatically against Immortals. And you can see when Immortals made like bad decisions, like Tigers after burning. I think he's trying to handshake the turret. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and then also the Sentry. They're so aggressive trying to take Sentry that they, they give over a free kill. Um, and then those are the things that SK needs to watch out for because they are really good at taking advantage of opponents making mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the mistake that was made in game one was fighting a Lance in the jungle. It's something that we've been talking about for the last couple of days just because when Lance comes into the meta, when he becomes one of these very powerful captains, that is always going to be one of his win conditions. Yeah, and I, we figured Lance was going to be a very prevalent hero this weekend. Uh, someone that may end up earning some first bans along the way. But right now, I think it's starting to get to that point. It's starting to become an issue where if you have this Lance, you just have such a clear advantage when you get to those later game team fights, when a lot of the fighting is happening in the jungle because teams want to stay near and ready for a Kraken potential. So uh, a lot of fights do end up happening in those tight corridors or in those choke points where Lance excels so much. Yeah, it's very difficult as well often to actually pick where the fight is going to happen. It's not something where you get to necessarily decide if the enemy engages onto you. The fight has already started. You don't get to choose at that point. So it's a lot about the positioning in advance of the fight to make sure that you can't get caught out, that the enemy Lance can't just engage on you. Yeah, and exa that's exactly the case. And Catherine actually counters Lance to a certain extent. It's more of a skill matchup. But Raph, you know, he uses his stun to avoid the, la the Lance route. When Cap, if you if you have the reflex, you can actually stun Lance out of his route. Um, and then he had Echo and didn't land a lot of Echo sil silences. So I felt like it was a missed opportunity to really leverage Catherine and that deadly Echo silence onto um, Immortals and try to make a play from there. Do we feel like the, this first game in this series maybe was a matter of SK trying to to take the game too early on? Do we need to see them stall it out a little bit later and play more of that kind of late game style, especially with a Celeste pick? I don't know if they really need to play more towards the late game. I think they were okay with the way that they were playing this game out. Like I said, a lot of it was just these two teams getting a feel for each other, trying to figure out how yeah. their opponents were going to be looking to play coming into this one. Uh, and so now as we get into the draft for game number two, this time we're going to once again see the Adagio get banned away, not allowing D'Enzio to get his hands on that hero again. Yeah. Once again, SK, very heavy priority on this. Catherine Glaive going to come through for Immortals and taking the crawl off the board. So. Even though it didn't really work out for and SK last Lance. time, still don't want it on the table. Yeah, I expected the Lance ban, and then, oh, Batista's picked it up because... Just to honestly, deny the deny. Combat, And also, right? Max Green plays a really solid Batista. And they can flex it, actually, because Tigers yesterday. also plays a really good Batista, and then, and then Max you know, can also play a Captain Blade. Yeah, so a few different ways Immortals can make this composition work for themselves, but making sure as well that they don't go into that Catherine Batista. I think it was Immortals were the ones that in the challenge battles kind of really, really showed why this Catherine Batiste can be so deadly. So they know full well the, the brunt of that power. Now SK, they have a double pick on their hands. Where are they likely to go with this? This is tough for them because Batiste and Glaive are just so good. It's like Glaive and Lance, honestly. You have an Ordain, you have a Mojo Slow, you have a Glaive Afterburn. There's a lot of CC and combo potential coming out of this composition. And Catherine can only offer a stun. She can't really displace anybody, get in wall, uh, or she can't really um, peel as well. Like, like a Lance can or a Finn, for example. So they're gonna go with Celeste here, which is a little bit risky because there's two stuns on the side of Immortals and also a Fearsome Shade echoed can cancel um, a Celeste ultimate, etc. So I feel like this is a little risky picking up the Celeste here, but they, they're favoring a CC comp. They want a CC comp here. Well, we'll see how they're gonna round this one out. Obviously, Krull has been taken off the board. That's kind of the classic look. Black Feather 
is going to be the decision on that one. And, you know, Blackfeather can definitely work in this scenario. Blackfeather's always going to be great when you're going into CC. Yeah, he can he can get out of the Ordain with his uh, Rose Offensive, which makes him immune to debuffs. So Blackfeather is actually a very, very smart pick. But also it's good against a squishy hyper carry that Immortals will probably pick here. Blackfeather is, a, is an assassin. Um, so there, or Morales will go ahead and pick his scarf. So remember at World, Zeo played this scarf and TSM did not ban it away until Immortals won, or at the time Zeo won two games against TSM. So I think SK, they may, they may have to think about this scarf. If, if they lose again against Zeo's scarf, they have to think twice about it. Yeah, I mean, he played exceptionally in game one. Some of the Dragon's Breaths were just game winning in themselves. Yeah, and that's the difficult thing. If they do win with this scarf again, you have to then look at maybe banning yep. the Scarf, but then you're going to leave the, be very likely the Adagio open. And this is one of those things that makes D'Enzio such a dangerous player, is his ability to take these heroes and just say, I'm going to play this hero to the ability where you have to ban it against me. And then once you ban it, oh look, I've got another one. And that's the thing, if you have to ban everything against Zio, what about the rest of his <laughs> team? We've got to get over to the castles. We've got to get into the next game. Let's take this away with the third quarterfinal. So Adagio banned away and Scarf once again for D'Enzio. Do SK have a composition that can deal with this guy? I mean, I actually think what's kind of tough when you come into a tournament like this and you start seeing a meta that's different than what you're using work is when you get into the draft, like, how does your analyst work, right? Like, how are they actually directing you to shut down these picks that are so strong? I mean, if it isn't, you know, if it isn't broken, don't fix it kind of thing for D'Enzio here on this Scarf, but the Batiste, the Glaive, I mean, this is a tough, tough matchup for SK. A really tough matchup, and I, I like the Black Feather pick actually mm -hmm. coming out. I think it makes a whole lot of sense with all of that lockdown. Yeah, you have the ability to get into the back lane onto the Scarf if need be, but also you can get in there, poke Rose Offensive back out if you get ordained up. I do like that. I mean, it, it's what they had to do. I mean, they see a draft that they have a hard time figuring out what the right pick is going to be, and they're just like, we know we have to get out of ordained, we have to get out of Afterburn, and Black Feather is going to be the hero to let us do this. All right, guys. Well, we are loaded into the Halcyon full. This is going to be game two between Immortals and SK Gaming. Let's see if EU can take one of these North American teams down. Immortals up one game here. This is going to be a tough hill to climb. Max Green playing games early. Rap's going to be there to zone him out. Will be a tough hill to climb, Humanist, but Kavalifar on the Celeste is really going to have to show up. We saw this matchup last game, Kavalifar versus D'Enzio on these mage picks, but the jungle has changed up a little bit. Don't have all the same heroes down there, so a couple of different things to have to think about. One, will the Caltern actually be able to synergize those stuns with the core collapse so Blackfeather can take out a target, and can they block? these fearsome shades coming out of max screen these ordains these afterburns it's a lot of cc for kavalfar to have to worry about yeah that's really funny when you look at it that way knowing that there's a catherine on your team and oftentimes your opponent is the one worried about blocking everything that can come out of that catherine um one of the things that i'm actually curious about how it's going to play out you know europe has been adjusting to the North American aggression, right? And we, we've heard all these teams talk about what they've done to try and adjust to that. But when you look at the Celeste and the Black Feather, these are two heroes that love to get their level eight. That's where a huge power spike comes from them. Can Immortals abuse that here? I definitely think they can to an extent with the Afterburns coming out of T-Tigers, but he is going to have to execute better than he did in game one. Yes, Immortals took the win, but T-Tigers had a couple of sloppy Afterburn plays in the early game, tagged the turret twice with the Afterburn punt instead of the intended to target. So maybe even T-Tigers, a god amongst men, get some nerves. Yeah, maybe uh, setting him up. Oh, who got set up right there? Max Green, gonna take a little dirt nap. A little dirt nap indeed. Oh, Max Green, you don't have the ability to get out. You didn't have the ability to drop an Ordain down. So, unfortunate for him, he goes down. But of all people to lose, generally early game, your captain dying is the best case scenario. You don't have any farm going away to the turret. is still able to pretty safely go here. D Tiger, the afterburn. dnzo has got the goop. Spent fire. That's going to be Celeste dropping. The mortals are on the board with a score of 1-1. One one. D Tigers. Got it this time. Came up from the other side of the jungle. A counter gank rotation through the enemy pathing is so valuable to really catch them off guard. So many times you're pushing up, you think you're safe as long as you have forward vision. But right. if you don't have vision in your own jungle, and we see on the mini map here, scout trap from Immortals on the side of SK Gaming, giving them crucial information. It doesn't look like it was actually popped. So the longer the scout trap stays right underneath their lane turrets, it's going to continue feeding Immortals information they can work with. I really like that placement right there. It's just slightly out of a, a normal spot. 
that you're not going to look to pop it off early if you're just moving through a lot of these common rotations through the jungle. And T-Tigers, a very Von T-esque rotation coming out of him. These guys often compared to each other in their abilities here. T-Tigers moving up once again. He's going to be stunned up. Tyrus is there, flying some damage. You see the Heliogenesis damage starting to stack up. You definitely want to hold your afterburn as long as you can, but it's not worth dying to save the cooldown. So T-Tigers will use that to get out of that sticky situation. Definitely smart. There is quite a lot of damage coming out of this. Fire game. the goop. Oh my goodness. The Enzio lighting cave all far up. Raps trying the to be the front side team. Tyrus is there though. Zio, he gets taken down, but Max able to take down Cave all far as well. That's what he was doing. Tyrus coming around from the backside. Oh, Tyrus jungle says, if you gank from our side of the jungle, I will gank from yours. He's like, Oh, that worked pretty well. <laughs> Let's try it out. Let's test. I definitely do think Evolver didn't have to die for that gank, though. We had such a great rotation coming out of Tyrus that he wanted to bait it out just right. enough, but Blackfeather could have taken care of the Enzio there without the help. So you want to maximize the opportunities where you can. A little bit of a misplay there from SK and Gaming, but they will take it, feeling strong about some of these ganks. Two and two humanists, just a few hundred gold behind the game is still quite close. Yeah, you got to be careful. It's baiting yourself there. T-Tigers, another defensive afterburn to get himself out of there. He's looking for that sneaky rotation. Once he knows that he's been scouted out, he just gets himself back on his side of the map. Max Green pushing up. We do not have a crawl on the side of SK Gaming, so we're going to see a lot more adventures to the uh, enemy jungle here. T Tigers, the after burn back. Spin oh, oh damn! Chop him down. Immortal stacking up the damage and putting Tyrus down. Oh, SK, SK, you have to be careful. Black Feather is not level six. The reason why you picked this hero is because he can get out of so much of the CC that Immortals can put down, but you're making plays too early. Rap ordained, Duck Spitfire's landing as well. Max Green taking a couple turret shots, forcing the Falcon out. T Tigers <laughs> coming in like Superman looking for a kill there. Thinks twice about it. I uh, did not have the energy to actually execute the afterburn. Was not able to get in melee range either, so he is just going to settle for this front tree and camp. It's going to be all right with that, though. It is a little bit of gold. His pocket it's going to give him some energy back as well he does have the tension bow now no boot active though that is something to note glaive ganks are far more effective when you can use the boots to get into that afterburn range so a little bit of a reprieve here perhaps rest k gaming as everyone goes back go shopping so fuji one of the things i'm looking at here we have to assume that max is going to be building a crucible for his team at what point will we see an echo actually come out for him I definitely think Crucible should come first, but after that, Echo could definitely line up. It just depends on whether or not they want to put defense on T Tigers. I, I absolutely think an Atlas will be necessary during some portion of the game. It's just a matter of how are they going to prioritize this. Ordained on uh, Cavalfar there. Cavalfar okay, knocked back and just crit down. The Fountain actually keeps him alive just long enough. It's T Tigers who goes down. Tyrus moving forward, the road defensive. Back screen, full broken heart stack. He jumps in. Fade hard, almost enough to take it down. Zio, he's oh, trying to the Spitfire. Zio, oh, the Quark left, they turn to the Elix, it's the big thing, that's this game, now he's trying. Zio, burnt down, oh my goodness. I thought Cave Volifar was dead. Cave Volifar, how do you live with no HP every time in that situation? The Fountain kicks back up. Calculated. Oh my goodness, calculated, calculated again, and calculated one more time. Cave Vol roaring all over Immortals at this point. T Tigers wants to find the kill. Didn't quite have the afterburn ready to use. Yeah, didn't have it ready to use. And that is going to put first turret gold under SK Gaming. The first objective down as well. This opens up the map for them, which is exactly what they want. But Immortals feeling a little salty about Another this. Another afterburn. Tyrus, he jumps right back in, but he is burst down. T Tigers is in deep, and he will be punished for his overaggression there. Wrath, just living on a sliver of health. Living on a sliver of health, but he is going to hold the fountain, knowing that he's not quite in danger. Dianzio didn't look for the sneaky curve ball spitfire around the backside of the turret. Uh, but uh, we are going to see them still away at some of the front camps here again. So even though each team is kind of doing a little doing a little dive, doing a little duck, they are still taking small advantages. But human is 6.1 thousand to 6 point, 16 point two thousand, excuse me. These, I mean, this is even game. Yeah, this feels very close. I mean, but if we look at game one, the net worth really wasn't too different, but Immortals were consistently taking objectives every time, and SK weren't able to trade those. I mean, they got a gold miner here or there, but they weren't able to actually push turrets. It's kind of a different story here. Yeah, it looks like it's flipped. Like, SK kind of feels like Immortals in game one. The team fight's a little bit messy, everyone kind of pushing the limits, but this is what you have to do. For, for these teams, their goal isn't just to win this series, their goal is to win the entire tournament. You have to test your limits right now on stage when you can in these early games. 
Well, I'm gonna test my limits with another uh, little pause here. We're gonna wait for these guys to get ready, to get uh, back into this game. But as far as things are playing out, I'm very impressed with SK. I thought, you know, that before we saw any games played for this championship, I assumed that if this matchup came to fruition, that it would be a close matchup. Mm. Based off of the Immortals' performance earlier, I, I actually started to question that. I didn't know how SK would stack up, but I, I think they've done phenomenally so far. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think they're they're reaching expectations in terms of how they should be entering in this series. It's just a matter of can they exceed them enough times throughout the series to really close this out. You see the team is here on the camera. I, you know, so Max Green, this guy on the captain, we talked about him in the last game. He made so many critical plays towards the end of the game to really secure the deal for him. His first time on stage was during Spring Unify. He didn't have the best performance, but he's really showing up in a big way. And on this Batiste, it's not quite the same type of lockdown, but we're still gonna have to keep our eyes on him. We, we talked a lot about the junglers. Like maybe this is a T-Tigers versus Tyrus thing, but I don't know, as this game is playing out, we're seeing constant plays coming from these captains to set up the carry. So I'm, I'm starting to sway a little bit. Yeah, it, it's actually pretty crazy. Like it felt like the junglers were both very quiet. All they, they were doing a bunch of work. It really was coming down to Zio versus Kvalifar. And of course, Max doing work there. Rap holding it down for his team. Max, I mean, he's a pretty quiet guy. We, we've got to meet him, hang out, chat it up. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. It, he's kind of quiet in the game as well. Ferocious though. Ferocious. <laughs> nice guy. The ferocious kind of nice, right? Where yeah. he's like bubbling over with ferocity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but he, he's a very uh, cool, calm, collected, very intelligent guy. You can tell if you talk to him uh, that he, he really thinks through like everything that he's actually doing. It, he, he's never just kind of reacting. He, he's always thinking it to the next step. One of the things that it, it's really hard for people at home to, to truly understand is just the emotion, the stuff going through your head during these moments on stage, right? We, we know what it takes to execute in-game. We know what it takes to throw out that major ult or make the major play or have the perfect crucible timing. We, we kind of feel that, but yeah. the emotion, the adrenaline, the, sometimes the nerves, the confusion, just not always knowing what to do and knowing you have a, almost a ticking clock every game when you're running from behind. It's just so hard to translate that and seeing these guys keep their cool at this top level of play is truly impressive. It really is. And oftentimes, everybody knows what they want to do. The beautiful thing is when you have a whole team acting as one, when everybody's engaging onto the same target, when they can trust that the Crucible is going to come out holding their own reflex block, you know, those are really the beautiful moments for me. I mean, it's really what separates the best, right? We talk about the fact that it's not just about using the abilities when they're on cooldown. Just because it's on cooldown, it doesn't mean that's the right time. You want to hold it. You want to be very calculated in when you use it. One of the things I'm going to be looking on this Black Feather pick on SK is, does he constantly able to, like, can he weave these on points and get the barriers on some of those Scarf Spitfires on that goop pole to really deter a lot of the damage coming out of this Immortals team? If he doesn't do that, he's going to just get shredded so fast. So a lot of these abilities are going to come down to just split-second decisions. Is it a situation where potentially he has to wait for damage to come out onto the Scarf before he actually engages? Or do you think if he lands an on point, he can just get in there, dive onto target? Yeah, I mean, the goal is that once the on point is up, do you use that opportunity when the barrier is down to be able to actually, are the barriers up to be able to dive, right? I mean, we're gonna look at a replay here. We actually see T-Tigers getting some successful afterburns in, but look at the heal coming out on Kavala part there, just staying alive. I mean, honestly, if Immortals perhaps committed a little harder, they could have picked it up. And we actually see SK, what I would have thought was an overcommit, but that Catherine stun into the core collapse, into the damage there from Black Feather. Just really impressive stuff here. But once again, we keep seeing these afterburns going. This is, okay, this is T-Tigers right here. This is him saying, I'm just going to give up my life in order to take down the carry. Something that's really important to notice is that it... The who dies does matter. It's not just about the one-for-one -one trade. Right. If the jungler takes out the carry, that is farm that's going into the turret that they're not getting. Junglers are far more gold efficient most of the time. They just need enough farm to hit a few items, but your lane mage carries, they need maximum amount of exposure to gold. They need to be able to truly absorb as much lane farm as possible. So sometimes those trades are absolutely worth it. Yeah, it, it, it can feel like T-Tigers may be getting a bit wild there. Like you said, this guy, he's making calculated plays. He knows the trade, and if, if I'm gonna come out just a little bit on top, it's all about accumulating resources across the map, denying them away from your opponents. And sometimes that's a slow grind, 
but you get to the point like in game one where Immortals got to, mm. and you just turn it on. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing to follow this up with is, you know, where does the discipline go from here, and who do the teams really focus? Like, who do they see as the threat? I, I actually think SK in game one, they made really great decisions on going in for those counter jungles, going in for the invades, but they didn't transfer that lead to killing Scarf, who was the actual threat on the Immortals team. They look like this game, they're trying to change their focus a little bit. They're trying to make sure when Dienzio is available, they kill him. We saw it just then, they went for a turret dive, but as soon as Dienzio went out for that kill, they turned around, called off the dive, said, take the Scarf down. We need this kill, we need to push him out of lane. Take that Scarf down. Zeal heard some rumors that EU had been improving, I think he can confirm them after playing against SK here. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the gap is uh, is it closing, I guess is perhaps what they said. I, I think so. You know, and we've talked about a lot of these guys. One of the players we haven't mentioned too many times, Raph. Mm. I'm actually very impressed with what Raph's done. If you look back, SK, you know, they a couple seasons, they were going through a lot of roster changes. The instability was a big issue for them. They really settled on a roster, and Jetpacks was in there. Yeah. Um, they were doing pretty well, but then they took Jetpacks out, they put Raph in there, and suddenly they just got a notch better. And I, I was surprised, um, because Raph had been in there before, and he was one of the ones that had cycled through. But this guy, he's played in the jungle. He substituted into the lane, not that much, but he was more in the jungle. And then into the captain position. So this guy, he's very well versed across the map, and I think he has a very deep understanding of the game. Yeah, and it's tough to find a replacement for a player like Jetpacks, right? Like, he's also been around for quite a long time, really diving into the scene in multiple positions, kind of settling into that captain role for quite some time, but replacing Jetpacks with Rap, I definitely think was a great decision. He's also incredibly powerful, right? He, he's a passionate player, just oh, yeah. like Jetpacks was. <laughs> I told him he did powerful. I told him before the turn, I was like, channel the rage, Rap. Channel, channel the rage and you'll do just fine, my friend. One of the players that I can definitely relate to. And we are back into the game. Looks like we've got everything going on here. This is Mortals hanging around next to that dead turret there kind of sad to look upon it from the mortal side. Always is sad when your first turret goes down, but that being said, one of the things that I'd have to say about this specific series is that we don't really see a lot of advantages taken after the first turret goes down. We were applauding the vision line being moved up, but it hasn't really been a means to an end. We're not really seeing teams look at going for those centuries. We're not really seeing too many invades, and I think it has a lot to do with this whole double frontline mage backline mentality. It's just, act it's actually really hard to successfully invade because you can get caught out in one back Bad team fight. We saw that happen last game. They don't want to risk that again. Yeah, they're playing a bit more cautiously. Raph on the front side here, scouting out. T Tigers, the on point will connect. This Cape Wallafar just clearing the wave out, throwing these Helios down. Now, he's level seven. Once he hits that level eight, that's the point where he's going to feel a lot more comfortable. You had mentioned this early on. It's that range where he's going to be able to just hang out on the backside of these fights. Yeah, hang out on the backside indeed. Taking stock, though, of a couple of items. We do see Raph parting ways with his team to go down and pick up what looks like is a battery. He finishes Crucible. He's got some flares in his pocket. So they are a bit ahead here now as they come in for this team fight. Yeah, Max got his own Crucible as well. He's actually sitting on a minion candy as well. Now, this is an item we haven't seen too much uh, in this championship so far. And I'm curious to see if we see a little bit more minion candy coming out. Yeah, I mean, honestly, at this point, when you have your first turret down, it's the best thing you can do to try to keep them from pushing too much. Yeah. A lot of CC coming down just to thwart off any unwanted aggression. T Tigers after burning over, taking his camp before they can take it. But Tyrus give him a little love tap on the end of that point. Bursting that mid down like it was Cave Olifar, just <laughs> letting him know exactly what he is capable of. Oh, SK feeling confident to stay on the side of the map. Max uh, playing with fire. T Tigers finds the afterburn. Cave Volifar trying to find the little core collapse. Actually connects the on point as well. Fierce from Shade going to be blocked off. This is SK on the chase. The Blast Trevor coming through as well. Rose Offensive Solar Storm just for style points. And SK take two. Oh my goodness, T Tigers. This is not the time to have some mechanical misplays. He actually used his reflex too late for the stun, too early to block the core collapse. DNCO. So my save playing with fire here on Scarf as he does try to get the farm, but uh, Kvalifar is not going to let him get him for free. That's an immense gold mine payout, payout going over to SK Gaming as they take the lead in a big way for the first time. A beautiful deal. I mean, you take a fight, you take an objective, that's money in their pocket. And you look, this is the net worth starting to actually climb up towards SK's side. And uh, Immortals, they have to be a little bit fearful here. Now, they're not very far behind at all, but this is the momentum building for SK. 
Yeah, I mean, any kind of momentum you can get is just so critical to close out a game because every little step, especially when you're all about these kind of mage composition, is just matters so much. And it was super important that SK were to secure that gold mine because we do have a little bit of a farm difference between Dienzio and Kavalafar. And when you're trying to rush to these items, every CS counts. It absolutely does. Tyrus moving forward on point connects as well. His, his infusion just timing out right here, but he does have his breaking point. So if Tyrus can actually get some damage down and stay alive through these fights, have that breaking point ramp up and then dive on the scarf, that could be really dangerous. Poke coming out from both teams. Helios uh, giving the vision as well as zoning T Tigers out. Max Green doing what he can to be the frontline force team, but he's not the tankiest of captains. He's doing a pretty good job so far. Tyrus continuous to throw out the on points. And T-Tigers, you can tell, he's just kind of on that bottom side, looking maybe where he can pick someone off, but realize he has to get back up where his team is, waiting for the afterburn. Zeo just clearing the lane out. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we saw what T-Tigers did last time. He got a little too aggressive, went over the wall, tried to make a play on Celeste, got punished. I like the fact he learned quickly from that mistake, playing quite patient over that wall, not going over until his team is ready to pull the trigger. Humanist, we are on a countdown to Echo right now from both the captains. I can feel it in my bones. I see the Void Battery Ooh. sitting there just juicing up. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good team name as well. Countdown to Echo. This is going to be Raph actually picking it up right now. Uh, Max as well. <laughs> you were truly uh, right on point with that analysis right there, Fuji, as always. This is a huge deal. How does it change the fight? changes everything, honestly, in a couple of different ways, because you now have flexibility. It's not just about echoing the ultimate. Wrath could echo his stun to get double lockdown to make sure they get as much damage as possible. That arguably, oftentimes, is more powerful than echoing the ultimate. On the side of Immortals, Fearsome Shade, that's generally echoed quite often because it is one of the most it's one of the most difficult abilities to avoid. It's such a widespread fear, so I'll be sure to see that soon. Yeah, it's pretty good. SK, uh, <laughs> uh, they're in the danger zone. Danger, danger over here. Looks like Crystal Century probably lives there. Crystal actually, no. SK Ballpark's gonna hang around. Just throws those Helios, go Supernova. Rest in peace, Crystal Century. Immortals not being the best team. The back you up there, let you take one down. But they're also gonna give away a gold miner because of this. Maybe a little bit of indecision here coming out of Immortals Humanists as they weren't really sure if they should pull the engage. They weren't willing to defend it the century and therefore they also lose the gold mine. Do you have a feeling of why they were so hesitant? It's one of these things that when you know you're behind, you don't always know how far behind you are and you're trying to track the items, you see the infusions on the enemy team, you don't feel like if you pick a team fight you'll be able to actually win it. It is something that uh, every pro player has to figure out. Like, if an infusion pops up, Nine out of ten times, what you're going to hear from competitive teams is we cannot fight them without at least matching the infusion. Right. And many, many, many times that is absolutely true. But if you're able to crowd control perfectly, use Fearsome Shade, get the Ordain down, and just delete one of the carries, the infusion no longer matters, and you actually get a little bit of a leg up because the money they just spent is now wasted. I think that's a really good point. And I was actually kind of wondering the same thing as I'm watching this because the net worth advantage is not too high, and but they have taken objectives, so I could see where Immortals could feel like they are further behind than they actually are. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, if you have two infusions on your team, that's a thousand gold spent. If you get a maximum payout from the gold mine for your team, that's 900 total. So you're not always breaking even, but you're a lot of times the infusions by themselves are just pressure. Right, the hope of Europe marches forward. Look at the supernova connecting onto Dienzio. Very threatening at this point. He has to hang out on the backside. But we have these Lots echoes damage. ready to go. You know these captains are itching to use these abilities to combo them up. Okay, Volifar just doing a great job to hang out on the backside and push. I mean, we talked about Scarf's pushing ability. Celeste, one of the best as well. T Tigers. An interesting afterburn, kind of defensively avoiding the damage coming out there. Damage stacking up this turret will be they're dropping very go. shortly here. Yeah, they're just gonna let it go. They have to. Dienzio is waiting for his broker. The ordain core collapse blocked off on the Zio Wrath. There's one fearsome shade gonna connect. Blocked off on one of them. Pirates moving the dragon spread. Zio moving for a solar swarm connects. It's K Volimar dropping low. The core collapse is there, but Tyrus Black Nest Daddy double kill for T Tigers. 
T-Tigers connects with Zio and Max Green to find an ace for Immortals. Immortals pulls the trigger in the moment you wouldn't think they would. If you were looking at D'Enzio, he had over 2,000 gold in the bank. I figured, let the turret fall, go get your Broken Myth, get your infusions, get ready to team fight. They were hesitant up before this point. Perhaps it was just a long-term bait. They were like, SK, we're not gonna actually fight you until we have our own infusions. Psych, take our turret, we take you. And in this replay, we're gonna see it again. They let the turret go down, and immediately, a decision comes in to make the call. Fearsome Shade is blocked, but it doesn't matter because T-Tigers gets over the wall, gets onto the Celeste, oh. knocks her into Scarf's ultimate. Burn, Ooh. baby, burn. Wow. Zio connecting with that Dragon's Breath. And coming out to two up means they are able to take down the first turret. I like the fact, though, that Immortals didn't try to get too greedy. They don't want to take Kraken quite yet because they're only going to be able to most likely get one turret anyway. Go for the turret if you're only going to be able to get a turret. Don't give the enemy an extra 1,500 gold in their pockets. Immortals, though, still a little bit behind on the net worth here, but still showing they can win team fights regardless. A one fight at this point? is going to be devastating for for whichever team loses that fight. It is probably going to spell Kraken. And with that, because of the Scarf, because of the Celeste, you have to imagine they're going to be getting a, at least two turrets out of a push. I mean, at least. I mean, and, and honestly, a lot more, assuming that the entire team is still alive during that push. Celeste and Scarf, both amazing at taking objectives. Even better at it when Kraken is in that front line. We've been here before, Humanist. This is the same time last game. Okay, Volapar doing his best to apply damage, maybe putting himself in harm's way. Spitfire connecting from Seal. It's Tyrus on the T Tiger. T Tigers with the Afterburn. Ordained into Fierce and Shade. A nice block. Okay, Volapar still alive. Dragon's been winding up. Solar Storm is able to take out T Tigers. They find a nice stun there. It's Seal. Oh, Fierce and Shade connects. Tyrus will be the one actually going down. Max Green. He's doing oh, his dang. best to be the tank for his team. Zio getting lit up by the Helios. Okay, Volapar on the, just on the pixel edge of taking this scarf down, chasing him. There you go! Finally taking that scarf down! These teams are having some fun right now! Oh, we saw the first fearsome shade come out of Max Green, but he was silenced for it's such a long time. He wasn't able to use Echo to get the second one out before the significant amount of damage went down. I'm actually surprised SK Gaming were not able to kill Immortals faster than what they did, but they still come out ahead, Max Green being the only one alive. This being said, Humanists, nothing really gained other than kills from that team fight. No major pressure gained either. Immortals still having the most forward vision on the map into the side of SK Gaming here. DNZ is going to be back up pretty soon. We do have No Wave on Catherine, though, Humanists. Let's talk about this for a second. No Wave is kind of that quintessential item on Catherine when it was first released in Vainglory. Everyone loved it on this hero. Now with Echo and No Wave, we're talking about silence on silence on stun on silence. Like, I don't even know where to begin. What do you block? Uh, you, just, you just let him come through at that point. I don't know. That's <laughs> rap, but he's going to find a stun. Helio start to rain down, zoning out Immortals. Uh, this is one of the things as you get into the late game with the Celeste, oftentimes, like you said, they're dropping him down for vision, also dropping them down to go to Supernova. You create a wall there, and I, I love what Kvalifar is doing here. Yeah, I mean, but uh, we have to think, the NCO has to be super careful. He does not have an Aegis, so a Solar Storm stack with BM coming through. Dane on the Kvalifar. Look at that Helio Genesis. Pirates on T-Tag the Solar Storm! Whoa, where did the dragon go? Baby dragon getting fired up. T-Tiger's going to go. He's able to take down Tyrus. Big crits coming out of the glaive here. Fearsome Shade, nice block off once again. Max Green doing his best, but he can't protect his team. He still lands this game. He's just a little Batiste, and he's going to get chopped down here. Can't protect his crystal sentry. T-Tiger's will be able to get away. It looks like SK are actually going to show mercy onto the Batiste here. Ooh, that team fight. <laughs> little Batiste, baby Batiste, trying to do the work that he can. Oh my goodness, this team fight, we talked about the fact, though, that this no wave coming through is the critical component of this. You see it, it goes on to Max Green. Oh. He gets silenced again. He gets silenced oh. again. Item silence, item silence, ability silence. Like, what can you do? The NCO is running away for dear life. This is just combos that cannot be avoided. If they do not get a second Crucible on this team, I don't know if they're going to be able to win any of these team fights. I mean, Mercy perhaps shown, but... I, this is just still looking like it's constantly going in SK's favor. This is so good. Right now, just Immortals versus SK, they're stacking up incredibly well. Pure entertainment watching these carries try to land their abilities and these captains do what they do best.
I mean, we have two individual Aegises now on the side of Immortals, but I'm still watching Raph. We talk about the captains, the captains, the captains. The ability for Catherine to have such a much bigger impact in these team fights is radical over the Batiste right now. Raph moving forward. He's gonna find a stun onto Tiggs. Gave all apart. He hit a spit fire hanging on the backside. Working no way. T Tigers, he stunned up. The fearsome shame locks gave all apart down, and they're able to chop the Celeste down. Now, moving forward, who's the target? It looks like it's gonna be Raph as Zeo pulls back with T-Tigers. Max Green continues to zone out Tyrus and, well, Raphia left for dead here, buddy. <laughs> oh man, well this is the play they needed to make. We were talking about what is the strategy? How do they win these team fights? Do not let Raph get off his full rotation of items and abilities and that's exactly what they did. T-Tigers pulled the trigger, he used the aggression he had been doing this whole time to really go up, make the move on Kavalafar. And we talked about this, right? If you delete them, it doesn't matter whether you have infusions, it doesn't matter whether you right. have all of your abilities. Make the move, make the decisive call, this will get you cracking and this is exactly what's impressive where to me though to is like T-Tigers, he, he had a split second to make that engagement, right? If, if he's a little bit too early, it's not gonna play out like that. If he's just a half, se a quarter of a second too late, it's not gonna play out like that. So T Tiger's just threading the needle there with that engagement, I love it. It happened right in the setup too. No Wave Gauntlet, as soon as it went out, T Tiger's went in and that's just the perfect exchange of abilities for Immortals win condition here. This Scarf and this Kraken, we're about to see a lot of destruction on the SK base here, Humanist. All items available, all ultimates up. It's about to get messy. Shaking in my boots right here, Fuji Immortals descending upon the base of SK Gaming. Their choke point turret getting melted down right here. They're doing pretty good work on the Kraken, as you would imagine. Did they go further? No, I don't think Immortals are going to get in there. Not going to get in there. They're Not going to get in there. They're going to say, see you later, Kraken. Thanks for your yeah, you help. Take, you take a free Crystal Sentry right there. That's right. You take a free Crystal, crystal Sentry, you get the tiniest little bit of damage on those crystal vein turrets there but let's talk about that for a second as well a lot of times people get way too ahead on these kraken pushes those turrets are not really worth that much you do not want to die for them they're not worth near as much gold and they don't give you any map pressure necessarily right yes a backdoor attempt is potentially possible from a glaive but scar yes he can fly but he can't fly over walls and batiste well he's scary but he's not going to be able to just morph through the wall either so we have a couple of conditions <laughs> here i just wanted to see him turn into a shade and just glide into the enemy base but yeah. uh Please. We'll see. If, if anyone can do it, Max, good. Max picking up his war treads here. I also think that's going to be a huge pickup for his team, just the ability to reposition his whole team forward or backwards if they find an engagement, if they find a catch. And, and that's the whole deal, right? If anybody gets caught, they're most likely going to be killed, but also the positioning factor coming out. Positioning is going to be so critical. Kavalafar cannot afford to be that far forward again. They honestly should probably move their team fights up towards the lane where they have complete vision of T Tigers. T Tigers able to get in a flank. He's looking for it here, but of course, Immortals being split up is not where they want to be. I like the tempered patience coming out of Immortals here. If they can't find the gank, they're going to back up a little bit. A block on the stun. T Tigers around the back. He and he's pop. found Kavalafar. Rest in peace, Celeste. This is Immortals on the chase now. Raph dropping low, had to use his boots. Dragon's Breath from Dinozio as he's gonna chase from about a mile away. T-Tigers got the stun though. He doesn't need a carry. T-Tigers can do it himself. Tyrus can just sit and watch as his captain and his carry get melted in front of him. Just trying to give him that speed boost, but we talk about it. We're building it up. T-Tigers, can you find the pick? He says, yes, I can. Just give me the moment. Let me flank around the other side. SK, you have to keep up with Glaive. You're not keeping up with this pick. It's constantly costing you. Immortals pushing in right now for these turrets. This is really risky. Kraken's up. They're going to try to end the game. They have so much damage. The first being Crystal Turret's going to be melted down. What's the play, Immortals? Looks like they're going to go ahead and get back. This is, this is the safe play here. It's the safe play, but I honestly don't. So Kavalafar's going to be back up. Tyrus is already up. Raph's up in eight seconds. They can actually go contest the Kraken. You have Scarf. The right call. Take Kraken with Scarf. Crystal you win the game. Defeated. Immortals actually making the call to go in and take that turret means that they might have to actually win another team fight instead of just closing out game two. So not the best decision making there, but Immortals maybe just feeling confident that they don't actually need to finish the game. Maybe they need a little more practice before the next one. <laughs> Yeah, trying to get uh, maximum efficiency out of this uh, game against SK here. SK moving forward, Tyrus lands the on point, hits Zeo. It's nice Blade stun there, up. move on to T-Tigers. T-Tigers gonna knock Cave all the far back. Dragon's Breath gonna be wound up. T-Tigers drops low. SK able to take down the Glaive. It looks like Zeo moving back here. Raph 
He's stuck inside that goop. A lot of damage. The Fierce Jade will catch him as well. Zeal has great damage. The Ordain is on to Tyrus. He's stuck Ooh. inside there. Keep all her low. Oh, you're in the goop, bro. Hey, oh, also the Kraken trying to take him down as well. It's locked on a Celeste. Rob, you gotta get back, but you can't take it if you got no HP. Core class onto the Batiste. Max doing so much work. Dio's gonna get hit with another on point. Spitfire galore connecting. Only four broken mid stacks for him at this point. And this game is on a knife's edge right now. I mean, there's no boot active available, no fearsome shade. They're not able to actually get on top of the team from SK. But we talked about this like we didn't. This was a risky play for Immortals to go into the base instead of taking the objective. And they actually paid for it just then. T Tiger's going down means another 13 seconds. He's not on the map. SK can start to capture the Kraken now, force another team fight while Ugh. they have the man advantage. <laughs> oh, I'm so scared right now. Spitfires come through. Here's some shades, gonna push two of SK back. Hey, Valfar not getting caught. Throwing down the Helios, making them go supernova. You gotta be careful. This could be Silence stolen off. Hits. Okay, Blast Trimmer is gonna hit. Blast Trimmer Second hits, hits as well, forcing them back. The Frostburn slowing them down, but T-Tigers is here. Can they do it? The drop! Oh, he, he stole, stole it! He actually stole it! This is a disaster for SK! Back screen is dropped, Jeez. but a massive play by Immortals. GG! Immortals going up 2-0 over SK. What a phenomenal play coming through at the end here by Immortals. You play with fire, sometimes you're gonna get burned. You get burned. When I talked about him curving a Spitfire before, I was just joking. He sneaks it in. I feel like it went between the legs of SK Gaming, landed on a goop, landed on Kraken. They don't even need it. The ace buff was enough to be able to secure the fight. Humanist, oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness. <laughs> Jake Tio Immortals. These guys are so impressive. I'm, I'm psyched for them right now. Uh, Zio really turning it up here, but this is a team performance. Look at them, these guys psyched up. Max even letting out a smile. Max smiled. We caught you, Max. We got you, we buddy. We see you. Uh, Humanist, honestly, I was with, I was waiting for T-Tigers to show up. I knew in that moment they were chasing them out. They thought they had the Kraken. Everyone's eyes on the prize. Kraken gets snuck from behind. That's insane. But what a heartbreak for SK. I mean, I, that was intense. We got to call the, the action, but we had our analysts watching that one, and they are ready to break this one down. Let us know exactly what happened there. Munchables, take it away. Oh my lord, that is easily the closest game we've had of the entire tournament so far. What a match coming in, and especially the match between Kvalfar and Dienzio in those fights. The one-on-one -on -one between the majors, just the positioning, like just trying to dish out the damage without getting hit by the opponent's damage. Just it's such an intricate fight. Yeah, I don't know if Humanist was right there. I don't know if I'm ready <laughs> to break that game down. That was absolutely That's what you guys are incredible. Able, right? certainly on. What a game. I thought yesterday the Hammers Immortals matchups would be the most exciting games we might see all weekend. SK is putting on a show yeah. with Immortals, and Immortals somehow, some way, managed to come out on top in that one. All I can say is that burn, though. Yeah, that, that final <laughs> that fight was And it was funny, if you look at it closely, Rap actually pulled the Kraken onto the goop because Zeal was silenced. So it was very interesting to see that. It was very lucky. And the beautiful afterburns from Tiger. I mean, Tiger's really showed up mid game and late game. I mean, his yeah. glaive after mid, his build was tension both sword blade monocle. And Celeste has zero armor. He literally half helps her in just one combo. And then another auto attack, she's dead. But look at the beautiful, yeah. like, fearsome shade with afterburn. You saw those combos happen so many times with Tiger's and Max Queen. They did an amazing job with the Scarf Ultimate supporting them. So it was crazy plays from both sides of the teams. I mean, basically, whoever initiated and basically had the better engage would win most of these key fights. It has to be said that Dienzio had some incredible dragon spreads across the course of this game. But I do want to kind of shout out Kevalifar in that game as well. He's not the guy that we often talk about when it comes to SK Gaming. Tyrus often steals the spotlight, but some of his ultimates, some of his positioning in terms of his damage output in general was absolutely superb. And some of his core collapses were 100% clutch and team fight changing. So it was just this entire game was so back and forth. It could have gone either way, even up to that last Kraken fight. Yeah. It looked like SK were yeah. about to secure that Kraken. They had knocked away. They had gotten the silence onto the two targets of Immortals that were there, but somehow the Coop ends up taking the Kraken away. It was, I mean, this is just heartbreaking for SK. Yeah, from a macro perspective, SK infused, like, Kvalifar had infusion leads, but they didn't do much with it. They did force a turret, which was very successful, but I feel like they could have done more, especially when he infused two times in a row, 
and he had an item lead ahead of Zio. He actually had Aegis ahead of Zio, and that's why they were winning some key fights because Zio didn't have that much defense. And then when the, the playing field was leveled, then Zio was able to match because, I mean, SK had a 3k gold lead at the 15 yep. minute mark, so it was their game to win, honestly. Yeah, and uh, we've got a replay of that final moment of the game. The moment that kind of decided that game. And you can see SK very much in control of the situation, but it got away from them. Yeah, can I just say something like Zeo and Max Green, what is up with them in like 2v3ing and like just being so successful and not losing these 2v3s and just making plays from it. But you can see the Kraken gets taken and by the Goop there. And look at this afterburn with onto Celeste. Even though it's blocked, she gets displaced with the Dragon's Breath and then the Fearsome Shade. This combo, I mean, Immortals, like I said, playing with surgical precision when it comes to these combos. And the thing about that situation as well is, if they don't get the Kraken steal, Zeo was on so little HP, but the regen that they get from grabbing the Kraken heals him all the way up, and then they can win the fight. And I doubt that they would admit it. They'll say it was completely intentional, 100% <laughs> calculated, but I'm almost positive that group was just put down to be a deterrent for them to be able to get out alive. They were only trying to slow up the members of SK so that they could keep their lives and try and defend against that Kraken. It somehow gets lit on fire and steals the Kraken for them. Like I said, they'll say it was 100% calculated, I'm sure, all day long, <laughs> but it, doesn't, it did not look that way in the replay at all. All right, so now it's 2-0 to Immortals, and we're getting to the point where if you guys are EU fans at home, you got to start believing in the reverse sweep. We talked about this yesterday in one of the series. A reverse sweep is a huge mountain to climb. SK have to win three games on the bounce. That is not an easy task, especially against a team as accomplished as Immortals. Yeah, for sure. I mean, SK needs to refocus. I think they're kind of tilting. I think the matchup, too, is Raph versus Max Green here. Max Green is just outplaying Raph on another level, and I feel like that needs to be evened out because Max Green with his Fearsome Chase initiating, they win those fights. If Raph gets a nice silence, SK wins those fights. So I feel like the captain matchups here are very particularly important because you see Max Green and Zeo, they have such an amazing synergy together. Not even a, a with, with Tiger's dead, they can't even secure the ace because Zeo and Max Green are just that good together. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, honestly, the whole team from Immortal is just exceptional mechanical play across the course of this series. But I, I, I just want to take a moment to appreciate how incredible that game was. Like, that was an absolute joy to watch from start to end. I hope that the rest of the series continues to be that close. Honestly, I hope that we go to a five-game series. I hope SK can go back just so we can see more of this action. Yeah, and even though Immortals are up 2-0, SK is at the very least showing that they can hang with yeah. Immortals, 100%. Both of these games could have gone either way. Obviously, you know, that doesn't mean a whole lot at the end of the day if you don't actually get the wins, but this is really good for Europe as a region to be able to show that they can put up this fight. They can be so close to closing out the games. You know, just a, a slight misstep a, that costs them the game in the end is all that stands between them and having this as a tied series. This is uh, all going to be resting on this third game of the series. And we saw Bayou on the camera just a couple of moments ago. And you can see him talking to the players, making sure to try and console the players. Because, you know, in a situation like that where it looks like you're going to win the game, it looks like you're going to grab that Kraken and then it slips away from you. That's not the same morale like hit as a normal loss that's also a surprise loss it also takes you from off guard a little bit that's one of those games where if you're an sk and you have a game like that in like a ranked game you put your device down you go take a, you, <laughs> you take a breather you, you just like you just lay down for a couple yeah. minutes just to like try and forget about it they don't have the option of doing that they have to be getting themselves refocused and ready for another game that could be just as grueling of an affair as that previous one. Honestly, if it's not as grueling as the last one, then I'll feel like whoever loses that game has underperformed because these two teams, I don't think we've seen, I mean, we were talking about this in the Fnatic versus Nova series, how close it was. I feel like we've reached a whole other level of <laughs> a, a series just being so close. I don't feel like the 2-0 so far represents the how close the two games have been. Yeah, it, it doesn't because SK Bootcamp in NA, and they have adapted to the meta, and you can see them like actually beat Immortals like early in mid-game. And Immortals, they get this huge live stage buff with Zeo, and now apparently Max Green has inherited that live buff as well. 
and they just perform phenomenally well, like five times over what people expect of them, and they always upset a lot of brackets. So I feel like this is very, very close between both teams, and SK can pull this around. They can turn it around. Mm -hmm. They are still the hope of EU, and they need to not fail to believe in that like yeah. they are they can and they can do it send them your energy right now in the twitch chat because they <laughs> absolutely need it they gotta win three games in a row i do just want to apologize to you guys We've got a short delay on the go as we're going to be restarting the router and making sure everything's working smoothly so we can continue with this series but i want to talk a little bit about the draft here because zio has been a focus in this draft it's fair to say sk have banned adagio away from him twice but now we're starting to see his scarf we talked about this after the first game his scarf is impeccable. Some of his Dragon Breaths have been not just fight winning, but game winning. Is this a consideration where you have to start to look to just, like, can you even ban out this guy? Because he seems to be great at every character. I don't think SK do that here. I, I think they stick with the Adagio ban because while, yes, Zio has played the scarf twice and has won with it, he has not been dominant to the level that he was with the Adagio yesterday. SK has found ways to put up fights against the Scarf. They've found ways to get these kills. They've found ways to keep these games incredibly close. So I, I think just because of the fact that they've been able to hold themselves up with against or up against this uh, D'Anzio Scarf, they don't need to focus on banning it away. So I, I've got a question then in terms of the draft and uh, just shoot me down if I'm totally off the wall on this one. But yesterday we saw a double CP draft out of one of the teams. Could we see a situation where we see a Celeste picked up for K Bolifar and the, the Scarf stolen away by Tyrus and taken to the jungle? Take both of those CP carries, ban the Adagio, and then you really start to limit the pool. Is that a world that could come to exist or is that just totally off the wall? That is extremely risky, especially against a North American team. Maybe a European team would work, but North America would play something super bursty and they're both squishy mages so that's extremely risky you need to survive the early game and the mid game to get to your late game power spike because na would just completely steamroll that kind of composition yeah it, it would entirely depend on what was on the op opposition side but i feel like doing because like suji was saying they're both squishy mages you could only do that if you were on a side and you already knew two yep. of your opponent's picks. With only knowing one of them, I don't think it's a risk you can take. And I don't think you get that far in the draft without one of the two being picked yep. all banned. Let's talk about Max Green a little bit here. Obviously, you can see the stats on your screen provided by VGPro.GG. Go check them out. But this is the life stats from this tournament specifically, not even including the regular season. He has on almost 9 KDA with an average of 11 assists per game. Wow. <laughs> this is... It, Max Green has been having the performance of his career. Yeah, and honestly, in VG Pro, he grinded and just has such a wor hard work ethic. He was number one in VG Pro in NA for a, a quite a few weeks. Um, and it just shows that his sheer mechanical talent and his ability to play any hero. He actually, the funny thing is, in 1v, he's known for 1v1 in every single pro player. He beats Zio in like a sky match at 1v1 because he's just that good on almost every single hero. Mechanically, just the god. Definitely want to, I want to see that. I want to, like, can we just take a break and watch that 1v1? But, uh, we'll see. I mean, we've been seeing already his mechanical plays coming out, and I, I'd love to see him more on the Batiste as well. That's something I feel like Batiste is a captain that uh, offers a huge amount of opportunity for mechanical outplays, a huge amount of opportunities for if you can position that ultimate correctly, if you can get great ordains, you can single handedly win team. Yeah, it's a situation where if you're controlling your opposition, if you're preventing their carries from being able to do work, then you are just allowing your teammates to do so much. Uh, one stat that was shown on that graphic for Max Green was his average damage taken per minute. It was around 860 damage per minute taken. If you extend that out to a full game of, say, average of 20 minutes, <laughs> that's 17,000 damage that he's soaking up in the game. That's almost the entirety of a regular, you know, average, uh, maybe slightly below average, single carries damage for a full game. So that's <laughs> what your captain is soaking up, an entire carry's worth of damage. That is so effective. And especially if you're on something like a Catherine, half of that's being reflected yeah. back to <laughs> them as well. Now, I do just want to quickly yes. throw over to Dan Gaskin, who's standing by with Dowsy, to throw a few words about the situation. Standing by in the balcony of love. And I've got a beautiful trophy here. You like my trophy? I do like your trophy, yeah. I know, it's very nice. I'm not going to use that to motivate yourself to just go into the next team fight, Tom headed. Raph is a player who has kind of built a brand around Rage. 
you ever watch Raf in his Twitch streams, he's always, you know, very high spirited. And so when you've got a player like that, it's definitely going to be the case that when you're in these high intensity moments, that emotion will get the best of you. But that's where Kavalafa comes in. He's such a calm spirit uh, and is able to, to steer the ship right. And Bayou, of course, is uh, known for his ability to, uh, to, to really put things in perspective. So yes, sometimes that is a problem, but I feel like SK have the tools necessary to actually direct that rage, perhaps, and turn it into motivational energy direct the rage, you heard it from Dowsy. Maybe that's what they need to do, but if they don't, it could be a 3-0 to Immortals, and then Europeans' final hopes are left with G2. And now this is a good and a bad thing. Bad thing is G2 are sixth seed from the European side, and they're going up against TSM. Good thing is G2 were the only team at London to beat an American team. You're gonna be casting that game. What are your thoughts about it? It's an exciting one. We've been wanting to see TSM. TSM have had an exceptional spring, uh, summer season. They had a very good spring season as well. They're just a consistent North American team. And they've been dethroned almost by Cloud9 back in London as the best team in North America. So they're back here and they're wanting to claim that trophy. Now, like you mentioned, D2, they did history by beating Immortals in London and being the first European team to take a series. Uh, and G2 has stepped up their game. I think that G2 at this tournament looks better than G2 at the previous London tournament, despite the issues they had during the uh, summer season. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting matchup being sixth seed versus first seed, because in reality, this is the nightmare for, for TSM. This is the hardest team they could have possibly faced on day two. And uh, for G2, that's got to feel good. It's got to feel good, but thank you so much for joining me on the Balcony of Love. This is the closest to royalty we'll ever get, but I think we're just about ready to get into the next game, so I think we should head back on over to the desk with Lunchables. <laughs> thank you very much. It's already past lunchtime, but I'm ready to stick my teeth into the dinner that is going to be the third game of this series, and I believe we're just about ready to get on into that one. So before we do, while the draft gets ready to be started, I want to bring up a conversation with you guys because we've talked a lot this weekend about NA meta, about EU meta, about the play styles differing. Oh, actually, do you know what? Let's save that until later. <laughs> Let's talk about the draft because it's underway. Grace has been banned away. Glaive has oh. been banned away. Let's see what Immortals will first pick. I think they'll take Cap here now, honestly, because with Grace gone and, and Glaive uh, picked up, Calf makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of combos that they can take. Is Adagio an option here? No, not a first pick because SK will probably pick Cruel and, and play that into the Adagio. So I feel like Calf is just and or Max on Calf is amazing. SK are going for the next level mind games and they want the Adagio. Yeah. That, it, well, no, K. Yeah, says maybe. he can play anything in lane. It could be an option. Yeah. All right, well, I guess we'll <laughs> see how it comes up. But through. I think, yeah, I think Calf <laughs> lands. But I think Calf is really good because. Uh, SK has been playing Cath a lot and it's been giving them a hard time um, <laughs> against Immortals. So I think Immortals is taking Cath away, which forces Raph to either play Arden, Lyra, or Lance here. Uh, but I think they'll probably go with Arden because Raph has a, such a solid Arden. It also forces Batiste to have to be considered as oh, right. a, likely a ban for SK unless they want to build a draft around a Batiste themselves. Obviously, we know that they are comfortable playing that hero. We'll see if it does come out, but there's going to be the Krull for SK Gaming. Yeah, that one has been kind of a comfort pick within this series. Obviously, we talked about earlier, this is not something that we know the team for. Banning away the Batiste, unsurprising with the Catherine Lockin. Yeah, unsurprising with the Catherine Lockin, but now the other question is going to be the Lance. Do they look to take the Lance for SK? Because Immortals, I think, is a team that could potentially run the Lance as a jungle, even though T-Tigers doesn't play it a lot. It's still a, a hero that he could make plays with uh, and set up a lot of kills for DMZ if they run him with a you know, Scarf or Adagio, whatever he wants to have. It is going to be SK grabbing the Lance. This is something that Europe has run a lot of. We've seen a couple other teams in things like VIS Pro run the Kroll with a Lance. It's all about just a massive combo yep. setting up for either a Celeste or a Kestrel uh, or a, um, a Scarf to be a hyper late game carry with that CP. It's a massive combo. Yeah, and I think here, I mean, Vox looks really solid right now. Vox, Kashka uh, could work as long as you snowball the crew here. But Vox looks really good into this competition because Vox can kite the crew easily, can dance around the lands. 
and then you have a Catherine silence and you have a Vox silence. It could be a very deadly combo. But say they're gonna go ahead and take the Adagio, and I think Black Feather will be picked here, yep, because they played this composition yesterday against Hammers and worked out really well for them. If SK picks Celeste here, it's super risky because Black Feather is gonna just gonna get on top of her and, and blow her up because a Tiger's builds Black Feather with Sorrow Blade, Shiv, and Tension Bolt potentially, and that's so much burst against a hero that Kvalvar just doesn't build armor, so it'd be very risky they do pick Celeste here. So let's see, but I think they will. They're gonna go with Celeste, because that's just the meta. And one of the things as well is you've got that Celeste-Lance combo. We've talked about it a bit across the course of this weekend. It's when the Lance can lock someone in place and you can consistently land the damage as Celeste, you can just burst, burst people so quickly. Yeah, they also could go for the Scarf here for SK, just because it's a yep. extremely similar, but a little bit more survivability on the Scarf, because you can get that fortified health when you use the Dragon's Breath. Uh, I don't think Black Feather is going to be as... Obviously, it's going to be a threat, but they have the tools to deal with it. Once Black Feather dives onto the back line, that's his mobility, that's his anti-crowd control already used. And if the Lance is staying with the back line, the moment Black Feather goes in, just immediately use a Githian Wall to knock him either away or into a wall. But they're going to go with a Samuel wow, instead. Okay. This is going to be this interesting. Is yeah, this is very, I don't know if this is good or bad. Right. So <laughs> we talked before about, we saw the interviews of K. Volopar saying he has some things up his sleeves. Their backs are against the ropes. Let's see how this is going to work out. It could be a lane crawl. It could be a lane Samuel. We know how much Tyrus loves to play that Samuel in the jungle. It might be lane crawl. It's lane crawl, I believe. I think it will be as well. We'll have to see as we get on into this one. Thoughts on this game before we jump on in? It's going to be fun. That's all I know. I don't know how it's going to go. I don't know who's going to win, but I know it's going to be entertaining. If all it's right. SK and Crow's laning, powered SK. All right, well, we'll see if they can pull this one off. Let's pack it. Let's pass it back up to Fuji and Humanist to get this one underway. Thank you very much, Bunchables, and our analysts letting us know this one's going to be fun, Fuji. Just packing some, some <laughs> things up here. Just pack it all just, the way just, up just here. Pack it. Exactly. Okay, Let, this is crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Crazy drafts. Absolutely crazy drafts. I actually I don't know what to think. But did we see who picked up who? Is it the curl? Is it the Lance going to win? I mean, we're going to find out soon enough. Yeah, it's going to be fun. <laughs> Whatever happens here. You know, SK, uh, their tournament life is on the line, right? Mm. They've put up a great fight thus far. I'm really impressed with what they've accomplished up against this immortal squad who look really good right now. Yeah, I mean, these guys, uh, they're off two wins at the moment, right? So at this point in time, it's one of these things where when your backs are against the wall and you're SK gaming, you're looking to pull out something that you think nobody is prepared for and you can't save it for finals day because you may not even make it to begin with. All right, well, you play to the meta, you don't find the win. It's going to be Kvalifar on the Samuel here. Kvalifar on the Samuel. So, the only notable Samuel player in a carry position of history was Miko, Mixsheen. So, it's interesting to see this come out because it's been quite some time since we've seen anybody really lean into this pick, especially from a carry perspective. Yeah, the last time I saw K. Volifar play this was when they accidentally forgot to switch heroes and he played a weapon. Uh, Samuel up in the lane. I'm sure they have a plan here. Raph taking a whole bunch of damage. He overstepped himself. Zeal uses boots to go Curse forward the Tyrus. He's gonna find a tasty little Adagio snack and smite him down. Oh man, some might would have said it was a bait. I don't know. Tyrus is like, look, Raph, here's the thing, man. What, if you die for me, I'm gonna get the kill. It's gonna be all right. I'll use that extra gold for another weapon blade here, but uh, I'm sure Raph doesn't feel too good about going down. That being said, let's take a look actually where the wave is positioned here, Humanist. So many minions about to push into DMTO. I really wanna see SK Gaming try to deny some of this farm if possible, but it really looks like Raph's just trying to make sure he doesn't get uh, his jungle invaded. Yeah, there's no uh, real harm of the invasion actually happening right now. Zeo, he's got that gift of fire, uh, just burning down the whole way. Now, Crypting Dark, the Malice of Verdict coming out early. You know that Samuel has so much damage, even at level two, just being in that Drifting Dark. One thing I like about him up in the lane here, the Corrupted Genius does give him a lot of regeneration and sustain. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's one of the reasons why in lane he can be quite a nuisance, because he doesn't really ever have to go back home to get energy, to get 
potions to heal up. So a lot of pressure being put on the two at D'Enzio here from the lane. I like it. Tyrus moving up. They found two Tigers. They're going to have the NCL yeah. damage to give King Wall to follow. Max Green dropping low. Tyrus, he's got that turret aggro. They'll be able to get it out of there without losing their life. On point from Team Tigers as he moves forward. Made a part onto Rap. Couple basic attacks. Nice. Get the wall will cancel that off. On point connecting as well. T Tigers feeling himself right now. Feeling himself, but respect to Rap for being able to make sure he got the stun there. That was the difference between him dying or living. So good plays out of both team here. I like the fact that SK is not playing from behind. They're not they're not acting like they just went down the two games in this series. They're still trying to apply the pressure when they can find it. Still looking for those picks with Tyrus. I want to make sure though we keep our eye on Kroll once he gets level six to see what they're able to do. T Tigers taking that Triant camp for himself. It is his technically and was supposed to be his all along. Yeah the Tyrus had marked claim to it so it was technically stolen away. Oh, man. But that being said, we still see D'Enzio pushed up against this turret here. And this is kind of the nature of the early game here with the Samuel. The Tigers in very aggressive. On to Cave Wallafar, drifting dark, moving backwards. Kiting not able to go down. Oh. D'Enzio's almost fighting the kill. Tyrus from the backside. Cave Wallafar hitting <laughs> around back screen, getting the kill. Tig's able to drop down. Tyrus not able to find the kill himself. I'm not, play. I'm not sure if they noticed Max Green just walking through the enemy team and going for the kill. With the, like, there was no attempt to try to block that. They just thought perhaps uh, K Volifar was safe, but that was not the case. Yeah, they don't know who they're messing with, this Max Green character here. T Tigers. Oh, we gotta get out of here. Impale will connect. Tyrus is there. K Volifar's dropped as well. Uses the Fane of Heart. Jumps up to the top side. Will go down. We're gonna die 2-2 two, two here, four minutes into this one. Many moons ago, it made sense to go into the enemy jungle to try to take some camps. Even if you died, it was oftentimes worth it. But right. It's been quite some time since that was the meta, so dying for especially only one camp, not worth. Not worth indeed. Nice splash damage coming out there as the Malice and Verdict empowered, able to connect onto Immortals up in the lane. But nobody going down just yet, not in danger of actually dying. We talked about the sustain for the Samuel with Corrupted Genius. Obviously, it's a different uh, form of sustain, but the Adagio, phenomenal as well as keeping himself in the lane as well. Definitely can keep himself in the lane. One of the things, though, is he does have to get that burn on the minions he's attacking. We have a fight. Tyrus moving forward. The Shadows and Power MT. Tiger taking a whole bunch of damage. Weakness stacks are there. Can he chop him down? Yeah, he's got it. Activates that Spectre Smite. Thing of beauty. Thing of beauty, indeed. Get the stacks, lay them down. The NCO, you're the next target, oh, buddy. They're going to go in for all oh, two men. Impale to get the wall as well. Rap turning it up. Rap making the plays. Goes down. Okay, it's all calculated. It's all worth it. Once again, Tyrus. Hey, Rap. <laughs> so here's what's going to happen. You're going to go down, but we're going to get kills. We're potentially even going to get the turret here if they're going to stay a little longer. Not going to make the risky play for the turret. But with Samuel in the lane, once he comes back, he's going to have a bunch of items. He's going to have a Shatter Glass most likely. Oh, he goes Frostburn. So they're looking for the slow. So they're not looking to actually blow up anyone on the front line. They're looking to do kiting. I was going to kind of pitch to you, Humanist, that perhaps the thing SK Gaming is going to want to try to decide is do they look for the Adagio kill, or do they look for the kiting path against the Black Feather with that Frost Burn? Looks right. like kiting the name of the game. Okay, I was gonna, I was gonna ask how that was gonna play out. From Hellsart, not quite connecting. Tyrus moving forward to get the wall, stunning up Max. Max with the fountain, but if SK to lose one, Tyrus goes down. Okay, Volifar kiting back does not have his drifting dark ready to go. And Rap, he's gonna knock him back with the get the wall, but they chase forward. Max looking for the stun, not able to connect, but Immortals are in a great place to apply pressure here. T Tigers rotating around from the bottom side. K Volifar's in a bad place. They have the flare out. He drops the drifting dark. Will kite back. It doesn't have tons of damage. The Frostburn. Oh, Tigs. Oh, Tigs ah. goes down. Not quite juggling that turret aggro the way they would have liked. Yeah, I mean, we saw Raph catch a turret shot. With Tigs caught his own. So everyone has their own turret shot to take home from the tournament today, but I have to question SK though, why they don't need to push so hard Ooh. here. Wrath boots forward, doesn't connect on the impale, but the damage to their stacks up, Max Green's down, turret should drop here as well as Cave Alfar can drop that turret aggro, he would have gone down with one more turret shot there. Uh, SK, they're gonna hang around here, this, this turret is incredibly low, Let's see, are, are they going to pull the trigger? Who's it going to be on? T-Tigers dropping down. Tyrus is empowered. Weakness stacks building up. Dead Man's rush for it. T-Tigers taking a whole bunch of damage. Tyrus is locked on. And T-Tigers just goes down. I mean, like, 
there, there was nothing he could do once he rose offensive to back. Yeah, nothing he could do. Going for more here. Looks like the first turret's gonna finally go down for SK. Perhaps, maybe not. They're still sticking around. Oh my goodness, they didn't have the minions far enough forward. And look at the damage coming out. Forces the fountain in a two verse three. Max doing an incredible job there. Of course, backed up by Zeo. Oh my goodness. Another impale comes out. Wrath finding the stun. But Max doing a, such a good job. The front line for his team. Tyrus activating the Spectral Smite, but Zeo continuing to hammer from the backside of this fight does force SK back. These are some of the longest team fights in lane I think I have ever seen in a Vainglory competitive game. But I have to say, like SK, they got the turret down, but they're getting a little ahead of themselves. Just be patient. The turret Helmus has no HP. Just push your wave in. You have Sam, you have Drifting Dark. You can get off some safe Malice and Verdicts into that turret to knock it down, put the gold in your pocket, but their over-aggression, their over-assertiveness from that initial team fight victory has actually cost them quite big, still not getting the turret multiple times in. Now, Fuji, I'm looking at this Black Feather, and in, in the recent past, we've seen a lot of sustain built up, a lot of lifesteal coming out, is oftentimes as a first item. We've seen Sorrowblade come out as a trend What's going on here? I mean, honestly, it's just Blackfeather wants to get to a target, max his Faint of Heart stacks, and actually execute the target. That's what Star Blade is going to allow him to do. Life still sometimes can be tough if you don't think you can stick to your target with Kroll taking down your damage if he's on you. Get the walls coming out. You may only get a few autos in, a few opportunities to get damage down as Blackfeather. So it's a very popular build coming out. Really key though, if you're on a black feather and you got Star Blade, you definitely want to go into some attack speed. So I like the path that T Tigers is going here. He's got the swift shooter, he's got the infusion in his pockets. Looking for a play here. We want to watch when this infusion goes on live here. He can also sell it if they think they want to prioritize something else. But one, four, and two, not having the performance he would like to have in this game, of course. It's been quite an eventful game. But Humanus, we talked about it before, the turret's up. SK's in the lead. We'll have to see if they can win this team fight. Drifting Dark, Cave all of our drifting forward with it. Tyrus trying to get on Zeo. The verse is let loose. It's going to connect. Big verse of judgment, but Zeo goes down anyway. Tyrus is very low. He uses Dead Man Rush to get back. But it's going to be, actually, T Tiger is able to take that kill. Impale coming down here. It's a one for one thus far. Who's going to go drifting down next? Dark. Max Green, can he find the. I don't know, he actually can't find the damage to get forward there. T-Tigers doing such a good job with these on points, tanking up damage, trading the damage there, not finding the execution that he would have liked. These fights could go either way. They're so incredibly close. I mean, the minion wave being there was so critical, too. All of that damage from Malice and Verdict and Powered was going into the wave and splashing off of the wave, so you mix those blocks from the minions with the on points landing you're not able to actually take them down but I was just about to say like SK they had a kill lead they get the advantages but they're just not able to transfer them into objectives because they are just taking fights too sporadically they need to group up they need to figure out who their target focuses they lost game one because they were focusing the wrong target they cannot afford to do the same here CO taking a whole bunch of damage keep all far in the drifting dark the mouse and party coming out CO gets the fountain he's staying alive but gets shot down. It is going to be the, the Samuel fighting that kill as T Tigers is forced back just on a sliver of health. And this should be a free Crystal Sentry for SK. So this is a fight where they're actually going to get an objective to your last point. I mean, they also hard committed to killing Dienzio just then. Like, Kavalafar dropped his Drifting Dark and just kept Malice and Verdicting towards Adagio over and over. Didn't care about anything else that was happening in that team fight. Got the damage off. They were able to take him down. We'll see if they can collect this gold mine too. It's Max coming to nice. 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 Very nice, nice job Raph. there. Raph able to seal the deal for his team. So SK, I mean, Crystal Sentry and the gold mine are off the back of that fight. Yeah, I mean, this is a really big deal for them, but that turret should be the next objective on the agenda. Immortals not wanting them to knock this down and pushing up this huge wave that I'm sure Kavalafar is going to want to clear. However, Samuel, if he uses a drifting for the wave clear, he does not have it for a team fight. Immortals knows this, so they want to shove him in the wave so they can get map pressure back on the own side. I think that's a really good point. And Fuji, as I'm looking at these items, I mean, my personal opinion, of course, Samuel has a pretty good amount of damage just naturally built in when he's in that drifting dart. But it's when he gets that Broken Myth that he really starts to come alive. Yeah, I mean, once you get the Broken Myth, you get your stacks up. He has the E for the extra life seal. He's going to be dropping these Drifting Darks, and he's actually going to want to be in the middle of everything.
everything. It seems counterintuitive when you're playing a mage, but his Drifting Dart gives him so much lifesteal per hero and Christy per Sentry enemy defeated. minion in the Drifting Dark while Samuel is also inside of it. So that's where he's gonna wanna live, but you have to be bold, you have to be courageous. Gavalfar is the guy, we'll have to see if he can actually pull it off. Oh, bold and courageous. What a, what a combination that the, they need here. <laughs> Kay Volifar is one of these players that I believe could pull through. He has the strong mentality that we were talking about is needed, right? Sometimes you have, like, Raph, he's a passionate player. Sometimes it can get the best of him. Kay Volifar, one of the guys that was always cool, common collected. Even back to the Team Secret days, when everybody's getting psyched out, he's like, yo, guys, yo, just chill. <laughs> yo. We've practiced this, we have a plan, it's time to execute. Time to execute indeed. SK really wanting to take down this turret. Right now it is 900 gold to their team net worth, not in their pocket. Every time they get close, Immortals is there as a three-man team to block it. I love the fact Immortals is putting so much priority on protecting this objective. Do not let it fall. Do not let them get the gold. Do not let them have the map pressure. But somebody was first to echo. We're gonna want to watch Max Green. How does he actually execute with this item? Wrath is still quite a bit a ways off from his own. I would like to see Immortals push up the wave, get some vision down, and look to make plays with this item. Max Green trying to zone Wrath and Tyrus out from moving up into the mustache brush. He's gonna find his stun. Silence. Combat roll over the top side. One blast shimmer coming through. The next Second one. blast shimmer blocked off. But came all of our Kaidi back. The drifting dark is down. He has some sustain. They take it. T Tigers down. Do they look for more though? Look at the massive damage coming out here from Zeo. But now they're on the run. It's SK on the chase. The fountain comes out, but Max Green is down. DNZO, can they find the, the, the actual lockdown? The impale from Wrath, a thing of beauty. They'll take him down. Yes. And SK Gaming find an ace of their own. That's not supposed to happen, Humanist. He beat him to Echo. The whole idea of being ahead is that you win the team fight. Oh. Immortals. Oh. Immortals, what did you do? Why did you go so far in? A little bit off site. T-Tigers, your aggression is what you're known for. We were applauding you early on today about saying it's very tactical aggression. Well, this was a little bit too wild. I think it go, goes back to your last point because you made about Immense the sustain from the Samuel collecting. when he has the Drifting Dark out. I mean, they threw it out. There. I think there was Max and definitely T-Tiger sitting in the middle of that. He was connecting on his Malice and Verdicts. He was empowered up. That was massive damage coming out. T-Tiger's just exploded. Yeah, I mean, Kvalfar also had a level 9 infusion ticking the entire time. We didn't have the same type of stability from Empowers coming over from Immortals. So a little bit risky, biting off more than they could chew. But the game is reset a little bit. We're at just slightly shy of a 2,000 gold lead for SK Gaming. Double the kills on the map. This is their game to win at this point if they play it right, Humanist. But still, SK struggling to find continued objectives even after so many kills on the board. Raph has his own Echo now, so we can look for that double Githian wall, whatever he actually needs to do. So a lot of lockdown potential here. And if that can catch Immortals off guard, it could be devastating. Could be devastating. The Echo is off cooldown for Max as well. In fact, everything at this point is off cooldown as we head into the 15 minute mark of the game. Kraken making her way on to the fold. This series has been a series about Kraken timing, about the 15 to 18 right. minute mark. That's where everything breaks loose, and we're starting right now. There you go, right on cue. Now it's gonna be the jump in on to Tyrus. Tyrus moves back with the Dead Man's Rush. He gets the weakness stacks out onto the Black Feather, but DNCO allowed to let loose on his damage. Tyrus dropping low. Okay, Volifar doing his best. Tyrus gets deleted. The Blast Shimmer comes out. Okay, Volifar trying to kite back, but he's shot down. Raph can't do anything to keep his team alive. Raph will go down. The Ace comes through for Immortals. Right on cue. How about a Kraken? There's too many things to block for this team. SK, they're using Crucible for what? For stun? I don't know. For, for Blast Trimmer, maybe a second Blast Trimmer. What about a Daggio ult? There's so many things they have to prioritize. I don't think they actually have a successful team fight win unless they're able to delete a target immediately or they have to get a second Crucible. They're gonna have to find something else to really be able to solidify these team fights. I mean, when we see this setup, we actually see SK the ones that want to go in on this fight, but Drifting Dark being used going diagonally towards the enemy side of the map means it is not available for this part of the fight where Kvalifar is able to stack up on top of the entire enemy team. We said the win condition for for Samuel in the, this composition is to have that up, have that available for the team fight. He used it for post. I mean, yes, he did, but I say that is less of a mistake from Kevalifar than 
taking advantage of an opportunity by Immortals, right? They saw that, they knew that he wouldn't have it available, and that's when they pulled the trigger. I really liked it. Yeah, I think it's, you know, from both sides, you have, if you see the opportunity, you take advantage of it. Immortals never going to shy away from that. Kraken pushing down on this turret. Humanus, this is a big moment, the choke point turret going down. How much will Immortals commit to this? How much can they commit to this with Lance and Samuel on defense? It's fairly easy for D'Enzio to, to deliver that, that burning blast damage trimmer. coming through. A blast trimmer will connect right there. A nice stun coming out of wrap. But this choke point turret is dropping very low. Kraken is incredibly healthy as they move forward. Zio just hangs out on the backside. He can let the Catherine move forward or the Black Feather, whatever they want. He tires. He continues to throw that on point, but a nice impale coming out. Is SK going to try and actually take the fight here? They move in, but right back out. The Drifting Dark coming through. Tyra's doing a good job to stay alive. The Fountain keeping him alive as well. Oh, they're going to move back. Very low wrap. He can't tank for his team when he's that low. Tyrus incredibly low as well. Waiting for the Kel down. Okay, Volvar is the target. They've chopped him down. They've lost the Samuel. Immortals are doing it. They're moving in. Max, he's low. Tigers as well. Yeah. Tigers is down. A double kill actually coming through for Tyrus right at the end. He has Atlas. Yeah, it's actually with the attack slow there, it's going to take a while, but I don't think Max is going to stick around. This Kraken is going to be dropping here. It's going to be turret. They get both. That was like one of the best pushes you could possibly wow. have for a wow. first Kraken pickup in the game. Oh my goodness, Humanist, the amount of focus, the plays coming out. T-Tiger is grabbing his own Crucible will be able to help block things in these team fights, but that push, that was exactly what we were talking about. We were wondering that how point, can they the actually hold, out. but Humanist, in these the moments, like, they don't they have Kraken right damage. SK Gaiman has through. to choose, do they the focus through. Immortals or Kraken? And in this moment, the indecisiveness actually cost them both of their Crystal Turrets. Kvalifar, just look at T-Tigers, look at how many times he he hits his on points in order to stay alive just long enough to be able to do just enough damage to take out the next target. And of course, I love the fact Max, he doesn't shy away. He goes in, he drops yeah. the Atlas, keeps him from being able to take the Kraken down. It's an open Max bank green crystal. efficiency right there at the end. Also, credit to Max. He was doing a great job to body block those Malice and Verdicts. I, I think he caught like three full rounds of those Malice and Verdicts coming through. I mean, Raph actually blocked the echoed silence from Catherine, but once again, it was still not enough. Like, it's just so many things for SK Gaming to think about. And Kavalfar's damage now is just no longer getting through the front line. This Catherine Stormguard shield here protecting DNZO so well. I just, this is a tough spot for SK. Like, I want to talk about how do they come back into this, right? Yeah. If Kraken gets captured by Immortals, they do not have a composition that actually does significant damage to Kraken. There's no. no true mage, there's no super damage coming out. And once again, Drifting Dark, if it's used for Kraken, it's not used for the team fight. It's really going to be tough. They're gonna need to get a pick. Hell's Heart has to land. They have to get the Githians, they have to get the Echo down, get the second round of stuns, or Immortals is gonna take this 3-0. Such a tense moment right now. SK's tournament life on the line. Immortals just need one good fight right here to take them out, to take this series. Such a big deal for Immortals too, who I feel like had a whole lot to prove. D'Enzio, you know, it, it's been a season or two since he was back on top, and he's really been grinding to get back to that top position, to, to let everybody know that he is that top laner to fear. I think he's done an incredible job thus far, of course, backed up by T-Tigers and Max Green. Immortals moving, rotating around. This is a positioning game right now. Yeah, it's a positioning game. Immortals is what they're gonna try to do is force the lane forward to make SK come up out of the jungle. SK's trying to do their best to keep a backdoor tip from happening. I like the fact that Immortals is making the forced call here. Iris coming up from the bottom. Humanist, he's gonna look for a pick from this bush. This is the moment. This is it. This is the danger zone. Tyrus, he moves and he's on to D-Tigers. The impale's there. Tyrus, he gets on to DMZO. He finds the stun. DMZO winds up with the first of judgment. It's gonna connect. They also land the attack. They're so coming down. They lost the game. All of far. Oh, no. SK crumble here at the end. 20 minutes in. Immortals find the fight they need to seal the deal here in game three and take this series exactly the way they wanted to. North America on a tear here in day two, Fuji. Immortals said we are one of the best teams perhaps in the world and they're proving it here with the 3-0 victory over SK. This is such an incredible performance out of them. They exceeded expectations.
heartbreaking for SK. Well, a sigh of relief from Immortals is they, they didn't go down to, to Europe's only hope, quote unquote. G2 still uh, lined up against TSM later on. This was impeccable play out of Immortals. I am so impressed with these guys right now. Feels bad, man, for SK because they did a, put in so much work they to get so to this well. point. They, they really, really did. did. To not have a victory in this series, I mean, that's pretty crazy with the, how even they were trading back and forth. So close every time. I have to applaud SK for all the hard work they put in, their drafts, the ability to focus in, take it so close each time, Humanist. But once again, Europe comes up slightly short. Immortals coming out of the Challengers, coming into the VGA, and coming in undefeated now in day two of the Summer Unified Championship. Yeah, I like the, the good sportsmanship. SK going in, shaking hands, letting them know, hey, you guys, you played phenomenally. Feel good about it. Guys, what an incredible series here. To break this down, we'll throw it over to Munchpool, Sweet Jay, and Tasty Bacon. Thank you very much, guys. What a series out of these two teams. That was the least one-sided 3-0 I've ever seen in my life, but just incredible play across the board from both sides. And Immortals take it in the end, and you know, they do deserve the victory at the end of the day. You cannot take anything away from this North American squad. They have absolutely lived up to their own hype. Yeah, that was an incredible series. Easily the most entertaining series we have had, maybe even at a live event, period, because those games were so much fun. Regardless of the outcome, I think everyone just got to enjoy a treat of a set of games. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. Yeah, hats time. off to SK. I mean, both games, they were ahead. They were winning. They had the gold lead, and they were playing so well. And it just didn't work out in their favor, but they did play their hearts out. And they left knowing that it wasn't a decisive 3-0. It was a very, very close series for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that's been kind of the story of today with our EU team so far, is it's been, yes, they haven't managed to win the series. They haven't managed to get on into the semifinals, but they have had incredibly close series. Now let's talk about some of the, the intricate details of that game. Let's start with the early game replays. Now, obviously, you can see that SK Gaming actually came off with a really good start. Yeah, I mean, they were firing on all cylinders right off the bat using this Lane Samuel, something that, you know, again, that little bit of a trick up their sleeve. It wasn't that unconventional, not the strangest thing we've ever seen, no. but it was enough to just make Immortals a little bit uncomfortable and allowed them to grab themselves a bunch of early kills and an early gold lead. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, th this Lane Samuel, I'm kind of surprised that it's not something that came out sooner, considering the CP laners that we've got coming in in general. It's an incredibly powerful pick, and it's, uh, I mean, Samuel in itself is a very powerful laner. Yeah, for sure. And plus, you know, with the comp with Catherine, uh, Blackfeather, they want to be grouped up. So Samuel is actually a really smart draft, and it, and it worked. It worked in the early and worked in the mid game. He was getting a ton of AoE damage, a ton of sustain and lifesteal. And Tyrus on, that, on his Cruel, he made some plays in the early game and did a really good job. But in the end, it was down to all three members of Immortals just executing their yep. composition and knowing who to focus and outplaying SK in a late game team fights. Yeah, and let's have a look at some of those late game team fights because that was where this game really was decided. And they were all so damn close. Yeah, I mean, every single fight just about coming down to the wire. I don't think there was any clean team fights in this game for either side. Uh, you know, we see, obviously, SK being able to find some of these fights. It looked so good. It looked like they were going to be able to take this. But once again, the turnaround from Immortals and the ability of Immortals to prevent SK from getting those objectives. I mean, you're seeing here, we're 15 minutes in. They only have that first turret. The second turret isn't even touched at this point of the game because Immortals were able to keep them away from the objectives despite the lead that SK yeah, had. Yeah, and, and in that fight, the Drifting Dark was wasted. It went the other direction, and they, that's when Immortals knew, okay, the win condition is down, let's go and engage. And I like how they focused on the crew there. Instead of trying to overly dive onto the Samuel, it worked really well, and they were able to kill Tyrus and then take that fight away. And that led to that huge ace that then helped them seal the rest of the game. Yeah, it certainly did. It was such an intense game, and you can see here, just desperately trying to finish the game, and obviously they didn't actually manage to take it at this point. Tyrus manages to hold on to the situation and keep his team in the game. Max Green doing his best to delay this and actually netted themselves yeah. an extra turret. Yeah, I mean, Max Green played phenomenal all three yeah. series. He, second time on stage, Zio has won a championship, Tigers is a champion, he's won a championship, 
but I think Max Green wants to set him his place in history and be another player to put a championship under his belt, and he's playing to win for sure today. Yeah, he certainly is. He's been playing out of his mind both today and yesterday in the series against Hammers as well, and this was the final team fight did not go the way of SK Gaming, and it was enough for Immortals to net themselves a victory on in this series, and honestly, We've just been talking about him, the man himself, Max Green, I think very deserved MVP of this series. We've been talking a lot about Dienzio, we've been talking about T-Tiger's presence, but Max Green's mechanics, his his game sense across this series has just been absolutely impeccable. Yeah, 100% deserved MVP of this series. He is the reason why Immortals was able to get these, just eke out these small victories. Yeah. You know, those team fights that are so incredibly close, more often than not come down to the captain play and Max Green was just on a whole nother level today. Yeah, we were putting a team together, you know, we made an announcement and everything back then when I was with Immortals, and I said, Max Green, we, we had to find somebody that could match Gabe Bizzo, and Max Green is definitely one of those players, so it's gonna be very interesting to see how Immortals will do tomorrow in the semifinals. Congratulations to the team. Very, yeah. very good job. And uh, a key point there, yeah, congratulations to Immortals. I think this has been a long time coming for these guys. They've definitely been working incredibly hard for it, but we do have an interview on the stage standing by alongside Dan Gaskin. We've got Dienzio fresh off his victory. Let's see how he's feeling. Fresh off the victory, and I feel like I'm watching you go from a boy to a man. You are absolutely destroying the competition, and I feel a little bit proud, like a proud uncle or father, but you have your mum in the audience. I mean, what's that like, having such support from your family coming to watch events like this? It, it's really good because, like, it just makes you play better because when you know that your family's supporting you and what you're doing, it just makes you more confident. <gasps> Gonna cry. It was an amazing game. It was the first 3-0 that we've seen uh, all event, but it wasn't that close. I mean, it, it looked a lot closer than a 3-0, if you know what I mean. What would you say you took from that in terms of Europe and SK's performance? Europe's players are really annoying. Like, Jesus. Like, they just... Like, they just... Man, they just stun us. They just engage, you know? They're just annoying, you know? Let us just win. Like... Nuisance players delaying the inevitable. Yeah, I feel you. Okay, so you'll be playing either Cloud9 or TSM, depending on the next game. It's going to be G2 versus TSM. Are you under the assumption it's going to be TSM you're facing? Uh, yeah, TSM. We have to root for our NA boys. And what kind of message do you want to send to TSM before their game if they are going to be facing you? Good luck and uh, make sure my bracket is 100% correct. So. Strong words from a strong man. Congratulations again. Incredible performance. Back over to the desk for a little bit more analysis. Thank you very much, guys. What an interview coming out from I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a bad interview with <laughs> I know. Like, he's such, such a great kid. And he's, just, he's just authentic. He just tells yeah. what he really feels, and, and that's great. In, okay. in a very like positive way, too. Yeah, and very witty, uh, witty. as well. And congratulations on moving on into our semifinals tomorrow. That's going to be another one of our games decided for tomorrow.